I think when you talk about player welfare, it's the long-term effect for me. It's like they said 11 days, but it could be another 11 more days under that because if he gets any any migraine say later in the week that 11 day starts again and just continues to keep building it was just a, a moment of madness and that's all the referee had to do at the cowboys game to say well hey you guys calm down chanel do that again yeah 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 maybe <laughs> Yes, kia ora whanau, welcome back. Ethram, Dills and Willie. It's great to see you fellas. Morning brother, hey What's boys. Up, First and foremost, I want to say thank you and I appreciate all your guys' support. Please like and subscribe to listen to more of this beautiful game, Rugby League. Big episode coming up. Also guys, just to let you guys know, there's some chapter markers in there too. So you don't have to sit through every single minute of our conversation. You can skip through to the next part that you want to listen to. So if there's Warriors at the front or Warriors at the back, you can go straight to the back. So I appreciate you guys' support though, guys. Anyways, big episode coming up. After him, what's coming up? Starting off with the Eels coaching situation, right? So Madge was in the running. He's now not in the running anymore. There's four contenders left, right? Michael Checker, Trent Barrett, Josh Hannay and Jason Riles. Who do you guys think is going to get the job? Bro, I, I need a little bit more energy. Please. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll try to give us something. Who do you think is going to get there the job? There we go. There we go. Oh, I don't know. I reckon this is, um, this is a tough one. I, I guess it all depends on what the Eels want, uh, whether they stick with Trent Barrett and, and what he does. And I'm thinking he's got most probably in the box seat because he gets an opportunity to work with the players from now until the end um, and then see how that works out for them. And if they keep winning, I'm guessing he it even obviously heightens his chance to get in that job. Um, you obviously have Checker who's done stuff for Lebanon. Lebanon, done rugby Lebanon league, stuff. Yeah. So he's done a little bit of rugby league, but he's a rugby coach in, the, in that. So I'm, I'm thinking it's more around... Um, what Parramatta want. I, I like Jason Riles. I think his apprenticeship under Trent Robinson, he's also done stuff with uh, rugby as well, but he's down in Melbourne and he's he's behind a couple of, he's been behind a couple of great coaches. I think he's done some, so he's done his time, he's done some system and he's a young coach coming into the game and I'm thinking these, some of these young guys uh, that have uh, sat behind a couple of these good coaches um, uh, would be great for someone like Parramatta. They're a big club, so they've got to choose wisely here and I think um, he may be in the front box seat for me, Jason Rolls. Yeah, Trent Barrett is the front runner at the moment solely because he's in the seat. He's sitting in there and he's doing it every single week. Now he's got to get performances and results, I think, for him to really cement his opportunity and for the club to to really have a look at him. But I agree. I think Jason Rolls has been around coaching as an assistant for a long time. He's been in contention for a couple of other jobs. He's done some time in, in England Rugby Union, learned his trade as a leader, as a about the art of coaching. And I, I think he's probably the one that I would look at. Michael Checker, whilst he hasn't had a a long history in rugby league, he's proved himself in rugby union both with the Wallabies and with um, with Argentina, um, especially when they beat the All Blacks. That he's got some pedigree as a leader, and he gets teams to follow him. And that's what he did with Lebanon at the World Cup as well. He had a good relationship uh, with Matt King, who was his assistant there, and they both came through and spent some time at the Roosters. So he's got enough knowledge about rugby league behind him, along with his career, I suppose, as a leader, as a coach. Um, Josh Hanna, he's been a great player, been around, been in the system for a while, was at the Cowboys. Now he's done some time at Cronulla. He's probably my second favourite Behind Jason Ryle. So what the big thing for Parra is they've got to, I think they've got to rush now and make a move quickly to appoint a coach. They're, they're getting down, and we've just spoken about Blaise Talangi, about his contract situation. These players want to know. They want to know who they might be playing for next year. So I think the club's got to um, get themselves into gear and appoint someone you know, pretty sharpish. The experts have spoken, Eels. Jason Riles is your man. So uh, just <laughs> do everything to get him done. Uh, yeah, they. I think they said. So I think they said 
before the end of Origin, they want to have appointed the coach, which is what took Madge out of the equation because he said, I yeah. need to focus on what I'm doing right now. Well, so. well, as well as it's important to find a coach, it's also important to find the people that support around him as well. So if you're thinking like someone like Michael Checker, if they end up going that way, it's who are they going to have around him to support him and whether they want to be around to support him because it could be the same thing. You know, say Jason Riles gets a job, does Checker want to sit behind them or does they want to get Checker in that that kind of role as well so I think it's important to get this coach sorted real quickly and then to report his support staff around them so that then players can see the strength and who they have then they can make decisions because you don't want to lose players because they haven't appointed a coach yet so very quickly like you said need to need to get it done so players can assess what they want to do and actually make sure that they are on the same page as Parramatta or the coaching staff yeah for sure <laughs> Uh, some people that maybe aren't on the same page with players and their club, it's the Tigers, man. They're in an absolute shambles with their with their business dealings at the moment. Obviously, Stefano, they've offered him a five-year deal, $800,000 a year. He's probably going to turn it down and he'll be available to be looking at other clubs mm. if he doesn't get picked for origin. Uh, Lachlan Calvin asked for that release. Uh, and you know all the that's the big one right now. Everyone's talking about it. You know, Ice already going. John Bateman rumored to be leaving. Jaden Sullivan's maybe out of his four year contract on the first year now. What the hell is going on? Yeah, it's it's crazy rugby league. This is, the game just keeps giving. Um, and I think when you look at Stefano, like that's a lot of money for. I think he has potential to be a, a great front rower, and, but it, he's still young in his career. And eight hundred thousand. Um, and this is where I guess the Tigers get themselves in a lot of trouble is that they put people on a lot of money um, and then things change in their plans on, on, on the way through the seasons and uh, players end up falling out of, I guess, love with what the Tigers are doing or uh, don't see how they're going to get better. Um, so I think, you know, with their dealings and stuff like that, I think it's just been really hard for the Tigers. Is that they've had to pay overs for players that come there and most of them not getting what they need out of them, but also everyone around them. Uh, you, you buy someone to have, actually help the team be better. And if you think of, you know, Jerome Luwai and him coming into the club next year, I don't know how they, yes, he's a great player, but how are they going to be able to get the best out of every single person in that team so they can perform at their highest standard? Because at the moment, if you watch their performances, not everyone's performing well. There's some silly stuff that's going on. Discipline has let them down through through um, every game that they've played this year. And, you know, basic fundamental errors. Like, that's an individual thing. That's not these big signings. That's not buying players for all this money and then coming in and not getting their job. I and mean, it's basic fundamental stuff that they can't get right in the game. So that's where they're letting themselves down. They they try and, I guess, you know, Lockie Galvin is, is a key to where they need to be going. Uh, you put them with Jerome Luai. Again, I don't see how them two can change too much of what's happening to for them two to play their best footy. They need good forwards around them to actually create the momentum and create the space for them. So uh, they're in a tough place at the moment, and if they're, they've already offloaded uh, Isaiah Papali to the to the Penrith Panthers, I don't see how they're going to be able to keep um, all these other players. I guess the only way they can do it is Lockie Galvin's still contracted for two years, so they've seen Richardson's come out and said, nah, he's not going anywhere, he's going to stay strong. So, But which which then will cause a lot of fraction through the group, which then causes a lot of fraction through the club as well, and then more media pressure, which is not what the Tigers need because they're always under the spotlight. They've always something going on in that club. So um, with all the media pressure that comes with the Tigers – more of this stuff is going to keep creating that pressure on not only the club but the individuals in, in the group and their performance is what their eight losses or nine losses in a row going for ten and yeah. you know we much really thought they weren't going to be um, you know competing at their top level this year we may have thought they'll be competitive but some of the stuff that they do on the field at the moment like these guys aren't going to change that and and it's and it's been proven yeah some some real signs of concern for the club as a whole, for the organisation. When you've got two of your, your best young kids and your potential leaders, I suppose, of your group for the future and the ones you want to build a team around wanting to jump ship, it's uh, it's not a good sign of how things are going. And Isaiah Papali'i's left with a year to go on his contract and he's gone to Penrith and there's shopping players around. There's rumours that Bateman's been shopped around in England and... 
Sullivan, brand new to the club, big deal, you know, big signing for them in the off season. As you said, looks like he's going to be shopped out with a couple of <laughs> three or four years left on his deal. Yeah. Um, whenever you and they've got to they're they're that club and they're in that position where they've got to pay overs, unfortunately, to attract players. There's nothing else to attract them there. You know, they're not a championship team. They're not going to attract a player come to us because we're going to win a championship. They're not there at the moment. So the attraction for a player is, is the pay packet. Mm. And whatever club it is, whatever organisation, you've got to get value for money. And they're not because they're having to pay overs for people. So they're not getting the return back on their investments and players, unfortunately. And like Blairy said, it just goes from bad to worse for them. They've gone nine in a row now and... Some of the errors are fundamental, but some of the brain farts that they're having and sin bins that they're having week after mm. week, you know, we'll talk about it a bit later, but they were in charge of that game on the weekend at half time. But they've got some, and I've said it before, they look like a team of individuals. They're not together as a group. And you know, when you've got people jumping ship, that spreads that rumour and, and makes that argument even stronger. So, yeah, it's a tough one. For those two guys, and I understand that every player has the right to go and go out and get the best money that they can get, and that's what their agents are for. Shane Richardson, yeah, he's come out and said, no, he's not letting Lockie Galvin go, and I understand that. And they're going to have to dig their heels in. But if the young fella is determined to leave and his agent's determined to get him out there, we may still see a deal done. I'd, I can't see Stefano Utukamanu staying there. I can't see him being there much longer than... The word of him wanting to get out and other clubs circling around has been around too long and just gaining traction and getting stronger and stronger. So I think that situation is going to turn sour for the Tigers. I think they're going to lose him. They can't afford to lose Galvin as well. Mm. It's just a real tough time for Benji in his first year. And How have clubs that have got into this this type of situation in the past like gotten out of it? Like, Is this... Because it, right now it seems like a you know the end of days. Like the club could be going under at any second with how much bad news is just being poured on their fans. You know they don't even have a stadium and stuff like that. Have clubs gone down to this level of turmoil and come back before? Oh, I don't know. In, in my time playing, that there was. Um, there's always rumours about obviously or oh, and and things happen in the game where. You know they're, they're playing overs for players, uh, and and like we both said, like that club has had to do that for a long time now. But the quality that I guess it's um, it's a bit of a mixed bag of everything. I think at the Tigers, uh, it's not only obviously players, it's not only performance. It's mostly you know a mix between management, mix between coaching, mix between the change of coaches over the last how many years. I was there in 2012, and we had three coaches in our in my small three-year tenure there, you know, and that wasn't the best career for myself. Uh, you know, I didn't have my best time down there as well. So, you know, when you have a coach coming in and they change things consistently, consistently, and you're trying to learn different ways and you're getting different messages, how do you think someone like Lachlan Galvin can believe that we're going to go in a direction that is going to be successful for his development, but also show that the club's going to be successful because the proof is in the pudding. We haven't seen any proof yet that they're going to be at least contending for, you know, a title anytime soon. Uh, you chuck Jerome Luwa in there, and I don't know if that changes anything really. Uh, Upi Corosel come in, and he's most supposed to be, like, you know, a key player for them. He's been trying his butt off. Individually, like what he said, is like they're a team of much be some talented individuals, but collectively just can't get the can't get the job done. So I think it's a mixture of, you know, if you manage the manage it well, it's easy for us to talk about. If you manage it well, but again, they're trying to win games. Uh, it's a really hard to try and manage things when you're not winning games and you're trying to find players and players are trying to leave and you're paying big money for guys. So I think um, it all comes down to I guess your your your, your um, football managers and the club of yep. how you deal with these situations is do you just invest in the young guys um, and, and just hope that these guys are the next generation of kids coming through for you like Lockie Galvins, like Stefano, you know, and then just trust that they're going to be able to do it and build. But again, our game doesn't allow you to have a year just to put your feet in there and dip your toe in and, and try and win games because 
it, it's a game of based on results. And if you're not getting results, say this time next year, if Benji's lost 10, 10 games again, he could be on the outer as well. So I think it's it's management around how, you know, salary cap managing and, and football managers and where what what do you, what do you see in the direction of the club and where is it going to go and who do we back? The only thing I can liken it to is at the start of Ricky Stewart's tenure at the Raiders, they couldn't sign anybody. Mm. They had a couple of people sign contracts and I... <laughs> I may be wrong here, but Tedesco may have been one of them. Yep. He signed and then he, he went back on his contract. Uh-huh. Yeah. And he, cause he said he didn't want to go to the Raiders. Mm. So they had that situation where they've had to pay overs. And what he's been able to do, Ricky, in building a squad from within, start again. The club have given him that time that he's needed, given that faith. Granted, it's very different. Ricky had... Yeah. Had a couple of jobs, New South Wales won, won grand finals, whereas Benji's in his first year. But they gave him the time. They gave him the time to build his squad and get it to where he is now. He's probably come out the other side now where he's rebuilding again. But they gave him the patience and the time and the opportunity to get his squad together because that was tough. Nobody would even talk to the Raiders when he first got there. You know, they were a little bit like the Tigers are now, but he had to go out, recruit smartly. Recruit a team that he kept together for a while, mm. built a unit, brought them together, and that team's taken over. So, yeah, it can be done, but it takes time. Yeah, I remember that now. I, me- I remember that time for them, and he always used to come out, and, and people, and I guess the headlines was no one wants to move to Canberra. Yeah, it was, you know, and it was a running was, joke, that wasn't was, it? That was Tedesco's <laughs> stuff with him and stuff like that. So I think um, you know, a little bit different, obviously, the coaching. Um, and I think that's where... He, like someone like Ricky and Benji, you can actually say to Ricky, yeah, we'll, we'll give you three years to build something. No matter win or lose, we have trust and faith in what you can do because of your experience and your knowledge in the game. And again, it's who you know, not what you know around the game as well. So I think he's in a different situation than Benji. Benji's new to the game. Tigers are always under pressure. Do we allow Benji to just get his team that he wants for a year build these young guys through, but like um, Ricky, Ricky Stewart's doing down in, at the Raiders and then allow them then to blossom those players and those kids and then bring guys in that way. I think that's the only way they're going to have to do it. But, you know, do they allow Benji to have another year of what he's doing now? Yeah. And that's the big call because, you know, then the fans start coming, the media pressure's still there and uh, you're trying to keep people happy. Well, the concern, cause the concern is if they don't give them the time, then it's like you said, Another you know, three years and three coaches. You know, do they just keep rotating that through or yeah. do they give it time? Uh, we'll move on to some more transfer news. Uh, on a different side of things, Tavita Pangai Jr. is returning. Confirmed <laughs> now. We talked about uh, the rumours uh, yeah. a month ago. Uh, posted an Instagram reel that got a lot of people saying, man, he's not ready to come back. He's not ready to come back. But, of course, the OGs, you guys knew <laughs> what these guys don't know, let's be honest. Uh, so, yeah, he's returning with immediate effect. He's just started training yesterday Beautiful. with the Dolphins and he'll be making his debut for them on the weekend, I believe. Wow. I assume off the bench, but, yeah, what a signing, eh? Yeah, um, a guy that didn't want to be told by halfbacks <laughs> how to run uh, or told by anyone what to do. Uh, it's great to see Tavita back in the game. I think we spoke about the importance of, you know, what he can deliver and what he, you know, there's an expectation of him being the best that he can. We also said that it would be nice to see him go down to Melbourne. I still think that it would have been a nice, good, good decision to go down there and, and get your game back on. But I also understand that he's got a connection with Wolf uh, through the Tongan, Tongan squad, international squad. So um, gets a little bit more time with Wayne Bennett, which is nice. I think if there's anyone that can help Tavita stay on track and stay on path, then Wayne Bennett is that guy. Um, but he also has got a good relationship with a couple of the other Tongan boys in that team as well. Felice Kafusi's there, Zaka Toa. Yep. So I think when you're getting told by a halfback, Zaka Toa, who is your, your international, your test halfback, I think you have a little bit more respect. And I think... He's got to go back into the game and earn that trust back, earn that respect back from his, his individuals and his coaching staff and the players around them before he can actually start being, um, you know, telling people what to do. So I think great signing for for the Dolphins. I think he's going to add some value to their team, definitely. Um, even whether if he comes off the bench, he's an impact player. 
Um, I guess it's a slow burn for him. Get your feet back on the ground, work hard, you know, head down, bum up, and, um, you know, good luck to him. I think it's it's great. I think he's back where he belongs. He's back in the game that he, sh- he should never have left. But, um, you know, maybe he's reflected now and been humbled a little bit by being away and come back refreshed and focused and hungry again to do well. And being with Wayne, the guy that gave him a start, and he's you know, Wayne's a father figure to most, and I, I presume that's the case. He'll be able to lean on Wayne and get some advice, and no doubt Wayne's uh, been honest with him and his opportunities, but it's, he's also got a live trial. As you said, he's played for Tonga underneath Christian Wolf, who will take over next year. He's there as an assistant. He'll be working there. He'll get to see how he goes, and if he goes all right, hopefully he'll get a contract going forward, but he's, he's got a, the rest of the season and he's thrown straight into the fire, coming straight in this week, but doing all the boxing training, no doubt he'll be fit enough, but we'll see how much, how long he'll be able to play, what minutes he gets, but yeah, he's back to where he belongs, he belongs in our game, he's a rugby league player, he was a state of origin player only a couple of seasons ago, so if we can regather some of that form, and get back to being happy again in the game and do what he's told from his halfbacks, then he might go all right. <laughs> it, it is quite a good run. I mean, obviously the Dolphins are fourth on the table, so it is, it's not like you're signing with you know a rebuilding team that's just throwing a lifeline. They're giving him this chance in a team that is good right now, and the deal is only to the end of this year. So, I mean, the Storm maybe is still an option. Yeah. Obviously, Bellamy re-signed uh, for next year, so he'll still be there, and he was the one that was asking for him. Or then again, you know... Um, there was the stuff about Jeremy Marshall King maybe following Wayne Bennett. Maybe he'll, maybe Tavita will follow Wayne Bennett, or maybe he'll stay at the Dolphins. If he plays his way there, then yeah. he's got those. Yeah, options. I think he's he's a Queenslander too. Like he loves Queensland. Well, not, I don't mean he's, he's New South. He's man. New what South. do you mean? He's New South Wales, but he's gonna have him. Um, but he's he's from Queensland. His family's all up there. He's happy. He's better up there. So I think if he can be happy and you enjoy what you do, as long as you work hard, then you're in the right place. Yeah, the other side story to this is, and we won't dig into it too much, uh, Thomas Flegler. Yep. You know, yep. It's likely that he's out for the rest of the season. There was word only a couple of days ago that he might be finished his career, but mm. they've come out and said that he should be right to go next year. So he could be filling that spot. And, you know, the Dolphins might be waiting to see how that plays out as well. He's still got some scans and see some specialists and see if he's going to return. And I hope Thomas Flegler does. Mm. I'm a big fan of his. But that may be playing a part in the Dolphins' decision as well. And if he doesn't, they've got a backup ready made. Yeah, and the Dolphins have done well with those emergency plays. Obviously, Trey Fuller is a similar kind Mm. of a situation. Um, We'll talk about some big extensions that have happened amongst the NRL. Uh, Jeremy Marshall King is one. He ended up Beautiful. re-signing till 2028 with the Dolphins. Jason Saab has extended till 2029. That's bloody. That's too far. I can't even see how far away mm. that is. Uh, Tyrell Sloan until 2026. And David Armstrong. I'm not sure if it's confirmed, confirmed for his one, but he is going to sign until 2026 with the Knights again. So those are some important players, some young players as well? Yeah, I think the biggest one out there is Jeremy Marshall King with the Dolphins. I think he's been actually one of, if not their best player this year for the Dolphins and has got them and put them in the kind of the place where they are now with his stuff that he does around the ruck, but also with their forwards and, and his creativity around the middle of the park. So, you know, Dolphins done well to sign him up because I'm sure Wayne in the background, uh, even though Wayne says he must be, we're not going to take anyone from the Dolphins, <laughs> He would have been working hard in the background to try and convince Jeremy to come over to the South. So um, a great signing for the Dolphins. I think, you know, Tyron Sloan, awesome. I think he's been playing well at the at, at the Dragons. He's been doing some good stuff. He's a great fullback, young kid, great talent. David Armstrong, again, if it's confirmed, um, awesome for him. I think he's he's shown that he is a first grader and what he can do on the field. Yes, there's been a lot of pressure on him because he had to come in and step in for Callum Ponga, but he's done a great job. So a nice little uh, like contract extension there for him. I think that the surprising one, like you said, 2029, Jason Saab. Jeez, yeah, like you said, I can't see that far ahead either. I think, you know, I think he was already signed to 2026, wasn't he? Yeah. And then you extend him again. Like, again, this is what I think when it comes to these these managing contracts and, and, and money is that we put guys on these long-term contracts, but anything can happen 
in the time from now until 2029 and you know if he's not happy at the place and then you have to pay him out and this is where clubs get themselves into trouble again anything can happen with with him he's had a lot of hamstring injuries too because he's obviously a fast twitch runner fibers he works really hard he's fast he's good he's a quality winger he can score tries he's he helps you know he's done some really good things at, at manly but i just think that's a long contract uh, to have for a winger yeah and all has signed a, a long deal as well with the manly's trying to keep a team mm. together and seeing that uh, DCE is going to move on, Cherry Evans will be gone yep. uh, at 35. You can't see him being there longer than two years possibly. So they're probably trying to get a team that's going to have that long stability and be around for a while and hopefully, um, well, they'll be hoping that Anthony Seabold can get some success out of a core squad. And that's the only way I can see them signing Jason Saab on an extension on an extension. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, it's a, it's a strange one. On um, Well done to his manager. Mm. His manager's done a great job for his client. A strange one from Manley's behalf. But, uh, yeah, Jeremy Marshall King's been outstanding for the Dolphins since he got there. Um, over the last two seasons when, since they've been in, he's been one of their best consistently. And he's, he's grown. We had this discussion earlier in, in the season. I think he's... Uh, Really firming as the Kiwi hooker starting. That's where he is with yeah. with how he is in his form. So yeah, he's he's a great keep for so many reasons. Keep Wayne or keep Wayne away, <laughs> but keep him at the club and he he'll become invested in the joint and become what the Dolphins can build a team around. And the other one, David Armstrong, smart smart signing for two years on both on both sides of it. He's uh, Kalen's had a lot of injuries in the last couple of years. Um, if the club's thinking you know, we need to keep this back up, that's a great signing for him. It wasn't so long ago before he got his, his crack that Lee Leopards in the UK were hey. talking about signing him. Jeez. You know, he was just playing in reserve grade. There was whispers that um, he was going to be another recruit for them and he gets, a, he gets a game, kills it four games in a row. So, yeah, it's a, it's a great signing for, uh, for the Knights to keep him as that backup f- for the next two years. But, yeah, well done to the young kid too. He's, he deserves it. For sure. Um, so we'll move on now to State of Origin, uh, which was last Wednesday. It's a, It's been a while since yeah. then, so we've had time to collect our thoughts. Right, guys? Um, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, 38-10 to the Maroons. Have you burnt your blue jersey? Yeah. Ah, Holding on. One more, one more, it's one just more in game. The wash. It's just in the wash. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thirty-eight ten to the Roots, <laughs> and um, I mean, I guess we can start with Suali's uh, send-off because everybody wants to talk about that. So, what what do you guys think about it? Yeah, I think, and the game. Yeah, um, enjoyed the game. Uh, obviously, being a Queensland supporter, um, I think you know, in the first seven minutes, obviously losing a player was going to be hard for New South Wales to win. Um, I know I must have messaged a couple of my New South Wales uh, friends and just said uh, it's not a bad night to be a Queensland. That was even before the game was even done. Um, must we wish them good night and have a good sleep um, and talk to you guys in the morning. So I thought it was. A, I thought the quality of the game was still there, although there was they were one man down. Um, I thought between both teams there was some great football played. I think there's some tough players out there that done some great things on both sides. They worked hard. New South Wales had to work hard. They were never going to just roll over in their game, although they were down one man. There was times in the game where. Michael Maguire, I imagine, would be happy with that 20 minutes after the first half. I thought they said first start of the second half, here they come. They're, they're finding a little bit of momentum that's, you know, a key to what they want to do. Uh, but I just thought it was going to be a, a game too big for, for uh, New South Wales to come up against a, a strong Queensland team. If you go through there, 1 to 17, 1 to 18, for at least getting on the field. It was going to be hard to stop a team with 13 men and, and the interchange in the, in the players and the X factor that they have on that side. Um, so, yeah, a, a great game, great spectacle. Although, obviously, Soli was on from the field, I thought definitely it's it's a send-off. Um, it's a hard one because in the game you have split seconds to make decisions. I've been in similar situations. I haven't taken someone out like that, but, you know, I've been in similar situations where you have to make a read on something or if you're going to put pressure on someone, 
that you've got split seconds to make a decision. Um, again, we talk about player welfare in the game and people watching, kids, mums, parents, watching these games. It wasn't most probably not the best look for the game. Um, but they talk about, you know, the I guess the legends of the game talk about this as origin and these things are, are let go in origin. I think it's still the same game that we play consistently week in, week out. It doesn't change because it's an origin match. It's still welfare of the player. You, you have a responsibility and it's in the rule book of when you play against someone, the responsibility to, to look after them as well at the same time. You don't go into the game to hurt someone on purpose. Um, you make a mistake and that's what I think it was. It was a mistake. It was a poorly timed tackle. Yes, they're going to say that there's a little bit of slip in it. I get that. I understand that. But... You've got to be better. You've got to look after the opposition. You can tackle hard. We saw Liam Martin come in and whack someone. You can still tackle someone really hard and have an effect on the game, but you can't hit someone and make contact ahead. So the right decision was made on the night. Yes, it did affect the New South Wales team and the result, I thought. But at the end of the day, I still thought the spectacle and everyone would have enjoyed the game still. I thought even before that, before the send-off, I thought Queensland were dominant. They wore a little bit from New South Wales early. Cherry Evans runs it on last play, gets a try 6-0. Not long after that, Hammer makes a break down the left-hand side and I thought if he could play it a little bit better and he had his time again, he would probably draw Tedesco and pass mm. to dead and, and possibly go up 12-0. That's with 13 on 13. So I think Queensland was still pretty dominant with even numbers. And then obviously the Sinman happens... New South Wales go down to their credit. After half time, the third quarter, they were really dominant. And I I was twitchy. I was twitchy when Lomax scored off that kick and they get a try in the corner and you could just feel momentum starting to change. Their confidence was growing, but full credit to Queensland and to Cherry Evans. Mm. They knew they just needed to play a bit of a grinding game for a little while and wear down the opposition, which they did. And fatigue started to set into New South Wales and then... Obviously, Queensland ran away with it in that second half. So I thought Queensland was still pretty dominant. And even if they had a, had the numbers, I was pretty confident they were going to take away the win without Suoliti going off. But the Suoliti hit, yeah, I, I agree with Blairy. Um, there was some argument for New South Wales that Reese Walsh was slipping. But in the cold light of day and to the rules, there was some dangerous contact with the head plain and simple, and we've got to be conscious of the messages that we're sending, as Blairy said, to the people outside of the game as well. We're trying to attract some younger players to come through, and if a parent's watching that, and, oh, I don't know if I can let my son play this game. So the four weeks punishment that he's received, the four weeks suspension, I think that's enough deterrent and that's what it's got to be. The suspension's got to be a deterrent and send a message to everybody that this is not going to be tolerated and you can't do these sorts of things without these repercussions. So, yeah, I feel for Joseph. I, I felt for him after the game. I felt for him in the moment. Mm. But you've got to make better judgments. That's why you play at that level mm. because you're able to make the right decisions at split seconds and he, he, he made the wrong one, unfortunately, for him and for New South Wales. And Queensland went on to take the win, and we will focus on Melbourne now. And th that was that was a, that's the thing for me is everyone's running similar plays anyway, and the toughest position to defend is I think is the centre position. So you have to make decisions like like we both said in a split second whether you turn into the lead runner or you go out the back and put pressure on someone like Reese Walsh, who you know is if you give him time and space, is going to beat you with his speed. Um, so Swally so felt like he was under pressure, so he's come out to try and stop that, but made a wrong decision with his tackle technique. That's all it was. Um, so every, and that's happened a couple of times with Reese Walsh now too. T as Taylor May, yep. he come out, he hit Reese Walsh high, broken jaw. So they know when Reese Walsh has got the ball. He's, I think his speed, is, I liken it to Billy Slater when he's at the back of plays. When Billy was at the back of plays, it didn't matter if you ran, like you had to just run a good line. The person in front of you had to make the decision. If you were a second, like a second off it, Billy Slater will get you on the outside. We've seen Manu Vatevai do a lot of big hits on, yep. on Billy because, and that's coming from winger jamming because they know the threat of his yeah. speed. So... He, he's definitely on the tip sheet every time yeah. they're running shape. 
no matter who you play for, if it's New South Wales or against the Broncos, he's always on the tip sheet that, hey, you can't let him get to your outside because if he gets on your outside, he's gone. So centers have got it already in their mind that, hey, any time that I can make a decision to come in and jam him, I'm going to jam in. And this time, it's, it's happened twice now, Tom, and they've got it wrong. And I think when you talk about player welfare, it's the long-term effect for me. It's like they said 11 days, but it could be another 11 more days under that because if he gets any any migraine say later in the week that 11 days starts again and just continues to keep building so i think you know these these tests although they said that he passed his hia test he's passed his his head assessment there's a lot that goes into those head assessments and i've been through a lot of those things in my time and it's quite hard the easy one on the field is the stand-up balance test. We all see that on yeah. the field. You know, which way are my fingers going? You know, balance the one for what day is it? What's, you know, who you're playing? That's it. You can normally pass that if you're not KO'd like Reese Walsh was. Then you go into the into the dressing room and there's a a big test in there that you have to pass. A lot goes into it. I think there's remembering the months, remembering it backwards, remembering the day, the time, uh, the, the game you're playing, um, what's the score. So you kind of have to have a rough estimate on all these things. You get given 10, yep. you get given 10, 10 names that you have to remember. Um, and then you go through uh, counting numbers, say like four numbers to five them to six numbers. Months of the year. To, to how far you can get. And then you've got to do them backwards. Yeah. So, and then they tell you these numbers. So there's a lot that goes into yeah. these head assessments. Then you go through your balance tests in there. And then at the end of everything, you go back to the start of the test, which is obviously takes 15 minutes, and go, and they say to you, so what were those 10 names that I just said at the start of the test? <laughs> so, you know, if, if you're knocked out and you can't, if you, you've got to get eight of those right. right. Eight at the start, eight at the end to pass your head assessment. So he's obviously gone through and passed all of those things. So there is a, a thorough test done for these players. But at the end of the day, welfare, the long-term effect for me is the one where I think, you know, he was clearly knocked out. So that's kind of how that, that head assessment test goes. I don't know if they did that head assessment because I know that if it's a Category 1, it doesn't matter what assessment you do you're still a Category 1. You can't go back on the field. So, yeah, a massive test that goes into that those HIA stuff back in the dressing rooms as well. Uh, just point on what you were touching on there about lowering your tackle height and talk about Manu and how he used to get mm. it right. But yeah, there's been others too, George Tafua and Stevie Matai. Stevie Matai, bro. Oh. They used to come straight off the wing or off the centre and read it and just cut you in half. Yeah. You know, and that's... That's the technique we've got to employ and we've got to encourage that sort of stuff. That's great hits, great technique, safe, but used to rock people still. And he was a centre. So yep. a lot of those things, same thing, they're on, like on the faster fullbacks coming around the back. And, yep. man, when we get some clips up of that guy hitting guys and stepping them in half, well, you'll see what Steve Matai could do in his time. Right. And everyone would agree that, hey, if he could do it then – then people could lower their technique now and do exactly the same tackles. I don't see there, there's an issue in tackling them in that spot that he used to snap no. them half in because you can you can lower your body down to that, that height. Yep. And if you did and you did hit someone high, there may be some mitigation into the into the contact. Yes, you're still going to hit a high, but it may be the difference between a red and a yeah, yeah. and a yellow. <clears throat> in terms of other players in Queensland, uh, obviously you guys were right about. Daily Cherry Evans was man of the match. Both of you guys called it correctly. <laughs> I just didn't get the score. Uh, it, was, it was him and the other, the two old dogs, him and Ben Hunt, really. Yeah. Just from the start of the game, obviously, it was them on that connection for the first try and for the whole game till the last try. It was the last try, right, where he got the interception? Yeah. yeah. So they were good. And then, obviously, Hammer, when he moved to fullback, the man as well. And holy hell, I just want to say, man, Whatever this crystal ball is in Billy Slater's <laughs> closet that made him pick Cobo, I know he would have got activated as 18th man anyway. But if it wasn't a send off, then it wouldn't. They wouldn't have activated 18th. No, man. 18th man was Felice Kafusi anyway. Yeah, but I, I mean, like, if he hadn't have been, so if he what? hadn't have been on the bench. Yeah, yeah. Well, if yeah, and I guess like everyone was asking questions around why would you pick, you know, a, a back on the bench. He gave them the stats of his last few origins, and 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 it made sense to me. Yeah, you know what I mean. But he also made sense that like when you look at Cobo, he could fit into anywhere on the field. Anyway, he's a big body, strong carries. You could have put him in the back row. You may have put him on the middle of the park for you know a few, you know, five ten minutes to give him just a little bit of a blow. But 
you know, crystal ball. It all worked out, and he gets into this, his centre that he's been playing consistently at the Broncos. Hammer goes to the fullback where he plays at the Dolphins, and all just panned out perfectly for for the Queenslanders. Hammer was outstanding. Um, you know, we've spoken about how how nice he looks when he's running and how he just glides through the glides along the ground and. Some of those tries, I reckon he nearly ran past uh, Murray Tolungi every time that Murray Tolungi went to go pass the ball. And I thought, geez, that's nearly close to a forward pass. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. he was that quick and think, you know, some of those tries look real easy for the Queenslanders down that uh, right hand side when they lost Suali out there. So, mate, you know, those guys that you just mentioned, DCE and, and Ben Hunt and Cobbo and Hammer, outstanding. Um, but there's one guy over on the other side, I think, Lomax. Uh, what I liked about him, obviously, he he stepped up to his game. He's definitely uh, a winger. Um, he won't like that because he's gone to uh, <laughs> power as a centre. You watch his performance, and we'll get to this Dragons performance, but, man, he was enormous in that Dragons game as well. And I think, you know, he's he's been a, a shining light this year uh, in the NRL for as as probably the best, you know, close to the best winger going around. Yeah, and we've said this before. I reckon he needs to go and thank Shane Flanagan for putting him on the wing. You know, for what what he's done, he's had his best season for a long time. But yeah, we'll have to wait and see where he plays when he goes to Parramatta next year. But yeah, he's he's a winger. He's a winger. He's rep quality. Um, but back to Queensland, just Ben Hunt. I, I love him on the state of origin level. Mm. He's state of origin made. I I had concerns about him. When he first came into the Queensland side, I wasn't crash hot on him at the Broncos as a half, but what he's been able to do, geez, he's tough mm. for a little fella. He just throws his body around. It gives Queensland an option of a third kicker, which yeah. is hard to find in any side, a third quality kicker. But he's all over the place. That first try, just pushing up through the middle, knows where the play is going, um, was outstanding. And, yeah... Um, Having Cobbo on the bench, what a masterstroke from the coach. And it ended up being perfect the way it was. I still want to know, because I watched all the lead up and Billy kept saying, we've got a plan and all the players are, yeah. we've got a plan. I, I still want to know what that plan was. Because I'm <laughs> yeah. sure that wasn't the plan. Yeah. That wasn't the plan to lose Reese Walsh. And put. I want to know what the plan actually was because I would love to see him in the middle. I would love to see him at 13 or... It's a back row on an edge. Yeah. Oh, How steaming. Yeah, I reckon, I don't think he was going to get a run. I reckon if a back went down, he was going in. Yeah. Um, I just, you know what I mean? I think through the origins that they've had and some of those middle players have played some big minutes, there's some fit guys in there, you know, and they're, they're, they're quality players as well. So I didn't, unless they really needed him, I reckon he would have got on. But I think he was there for cover of yeah. the backs for sure. And, you know. And that says off. a lot about Collins. Yeah. Carrigan and, and Cotter. Yeah. You know, the starting yeah. middles, they, yeah, pretty they were huge. Yeah. I loved when they ran out and seeing how pumped Lindsay Collins was just jumping around and <laughs> taking it all in. And the, here, here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, along with Lomax, who you brought up, um, for me, also, it was a lot of de debutants. Robson, uh, oh, he, well, he's not a debutant, yeah. but he's fairly new, was crazy. That try saving tackle. Man, that effort when you already just know the game is pretty much lost. Really good. Lin Yu was yeah, the was, man. Yeah. He was enormous. I think, yeah, we spoke about how there's not many, too many players that come off the bench that can change the game the way that he can uh, with the momentum and the way he plays. Like the old um, lie down for the crusher, or for the ankle, the the ankle <laughs> thing, and then get up and then take the next hit up and be flying. Um, yeah, he must have should have gone off for bloody, <laughs> um, what, what's the old hip drop? He, you know, I think he fell down thinking he got a hip job. Yeah. Then he spent a bit of time on there touching his leg and then got up that next carry and then he got close to scoring a try. So um, he was he was massive. Um, he's a key player for them and I think he'll be there again uh, because the difference he can make off the bench for them uh, is enormous. Liam Martin too. Mm. Yeah. He's a soldier, man. He just chases every kick. You, know, you watch the amount of times he makes the first tackle on the kick chase. He's back there carrying hard. He came up with that big tackle to, you know, really lift the crowd. And they lose, Queensland lose the ball on the next play. So they had some really strong performers, but I, I thought the strongest performer for Queensland and where we did win the game was in the coach's box. I thought Billy Slater and, and Queensland outcoached them. I, I, I still can't understand 
why they left Jake Trebojevic off for so mm, long. Yeah, mm. That was a real strange ploy. I, I know that Spencer was going good and they had pain out there, but to make him captain and then to leave him off for so long just well, he baffles played 20, me. 23 minutes in the end, you know? Yeah. Ian, he's, he's a f- player too. He can play big Massively. minutes. He can play big minutes. He could have played that whole game if they needed him to play that game. And, yeah, to set him out there and then put him back on in the last few minutes and you're really not doing too much. You just wanted to get him back on the field, you yep. know? So, yeah, it's yeah. it's an interesting one there. And I know, obviously, there's been a lot of talk around, you know, why he left him on the sideline. And I'm guessing they're saying that there's a lot of moving parts that they have to get right. And I think sometimes you just get caught up in all of that stuff and... You know, you want your best players on the field. He started there for a reason. He's the captain for a reason. Get him on the field somehow. Yeah, and the other one for mine, it, was, it took New South Wales a long time to yeah, make the adjustment. To adjust, yeah. Yeah. To, for um, Swaliti going off. They tried to put uh, Olukoyatu out there. Liam Martin was out there for a bit and then just should have moved Crichton over there in the first place. Mm. And it took them too long. It took them two tries. Two tries, yeah, before they realised that yeah. they needed to make a change. And Nico Hines was struggling defending out there. And again, you know, with Cobbo, he's quite strong anyway. You've seen him just run over the top of people out there anyway. Yeah. So it was a hard place to defend. But yeah, like you said, a real long time to readjust. Um, yeah. When they got it right, it, it looked stronger. Much better. Um, so yeah, it just got to get things done quicker. It is origin. It is a big yeah. game. So. I guess last thing on the game will be the question for each team. So for Queensland, I'm assuming no changes, everything the same. We good. Yeah. And then the bigger (laughs) question, I guess, because, you know, as you always say, there's always dramas with uh, my team, New South. Who, for you guys, is on that chopping block that might not be there for the next game? Oh, man. Um yeah, I hate to say it, but Nico Hines, I just didn't think he lived up to what they need for an Origin game. Um, and in, if you and everyone watched the game, the last ten minutes, they were already speaking about how Mitch Moses is going and how he come back yep. from his return. You know, and I think that was a little bit disrespectful for for Nico that the, that some of the legends were sitting there talking about Mitch Moses before the game was even over, and um, the guy hadn't even you know, finished the game before they spoke about him. They're already trying to replace him with other people or trying to get the message out there so everyone starts listening. And I thought that wasn't a didn't sound good from, you know, from a former player listening into, you know, former players talk about people before the game has even been done. So I think Nico Hines will end up missing out. I didn't think Tedesco was up to where his normal standard in the origin arena. Um, so I think um, if if our mate's back He'll be straight in there. Um, he's been enormous. I think he'd be filthy that he got out of there, but I think he'll be back in. Um, and I think, I, I don't know, if they do they want to run two, two nines? Um, I know he did, Reese Robson did a good job, but just to keep the tempo, you know, ticking over and winning momentum, I guess if you can have um, Lenu come off the bench and then you have Uppy come around the ruck off the back of his of his. Playable speed, I think, you know, Uppy would be real effective around there. Love to see Mitch Barnett get an opportunity. I don't know where they fit him in. Um, I think he can, again, we've seen him play both back row and, and middle park, so he can cover those things. But I think maybe having a, you know, look into those few couple of positions, um, it may mean Latrell in the centres uh, for um, Joseph Soli. But, yeah, there's a massive cause going on, I think, you know, because there's some quality players in and waiting for that opportunity. Yeah, I thought the trail was enormous on the weekend. If that's his, um, <laughs> if that's, if that's his New South Wales trial, um, I thought he took it with both hands. And they're screaming out for him to get back out there. And he'll fit slim, seamlessly in that left left uh, left centre, crying over to the right. Um, my my fear is for Nico Hines is he may be a one and done as an Origin player. There were some questions that they played him out of position, put him in the centres when he's been a great player for Cronulla, but yeah, unfortunately, he just didn't step up to the mark that he needed to for New South Wales and the halves in his normal position. So much hope was put on him that he could fulfil the potential that everybody believed he had, mm. but. Yeah, the the lights of Origin are too bright for some, and it just looked a bit too bright for him. And I agree. And as harsh as it was to hear people 
talking about him being replaced before the game was finished. Yeah. Watching Mitch Moses come back, he'll be better for a couple of games under his belt leading into the second game. When mm. I think he'll be the seven in Origin too. Sweet. So we'll move on from Origin after Dylan. One last thing though. Says. How much weight can you actually put on? Like you're a man down for the whole game. How much does that actually affect the way some of these guys performed? You know, you're playing with less space. Um, you're always going to look a little worse off, right? Yeah. Well, I think I think they showed, um, you know, what they can do when they were a man down. Um, you have to, I guess the mindset shifts from defending with 13 to defending with 12. So you have to work over to, to, to actually defend really well together as a group. And I think the, the bit that we that he can control is the kicking game. Uh, he can also control the direction of where the play of the balls are going. Um, I think, like we both said, I don't think they adapted quick enough both defence and attack. They still try to run shape down their right-hand side yeah. when they had no one out there. So that comes down to, I guess, communication through your halves and through your spine. So he's a big part of that as well. So the things that he can control and the things that he, that he can do, he didn't do those the best for him for New South yeah. Wales. So I think that's what I'm that's what I'm talking about. Is I just don't think he stepped up to the mark as a seven to lead the team around. Although you were a man down, that's fine. You can still do your job yeah. correctly. Um, yes, it, everyone had to overwork defensively, but when you're shifting to a right-hand side, when you have no one there early in the game, um, you quickly got to look at yourself and go, well, where do I go next? Because until they got Crichton there, then that's when he'd come back into his own and yeah. started playing that shape. But before then, a part of his role is to identify that, know that, you should already know that. It means maybe coming to the right-hand side of the field and attacking left and swinging on the long side. Yeah. So I think they did that eventually. It was just too long for me. And I think, you know, with the quality of player that he is and the players around him, they should have been able to recognise that earlier. And I thought that responsibility fell too much. Oh, well, he took responsibility for it. Yeah. Um, Jerome Luai. He stood up and said, give me the ball. I want yep. the ball in my hands. Yep. When it should have been Nico touching the ball more often mm. and getting the plays and setting up plays for himself as the half. Get him in positions where I want to set up plays, but it ended up getting into Jerome's hands who should have been playing outside of him mm. and running what he saw. But yeah, I think that was the big kicker for me. It was Jerome stepping up rather than Nico, which highlighted you know, how much... He didn't activate himself in the game as much as he should have. If you thought that origin talk was over, well, no, it isn't because the women's <laughs> origin know. game two was uh, next up, which is on the Thursday. And again, Queensland won 11-10 to, uh, with a late comeback from some heroics from Taryn Aiken and um, Lauren Brown. Record crowd as well, 25,700. Mm, nice. Pretty good. Did you guys watch that game? What did you another think? Another win in New South yeah, Wales. No, yeah. On their home soil, we got another win, the oh. Queenslanders. Um, yeah, I, like, I watched this game. I enjoyed this one. Um, obviously, I wanted Queensland to win, so sitting there riding them home through the game thinking, I don't think we're going to win this one. I think it's going to be a clean it's clean sweep. If you go through that New South Wales women's team, they have got quality all through there. I don't see how they lost this game. I guess they... Maybe it's taken, took the pedal off, took the foot off the pedal through the game. Um, obviously, the the weather was terrible, it was wet, um, but it was still a high quality game. Um, the skill level was there. Uh, True, Queensland spirit hung in there right to the end, and I think that's what it takes in Origin Origin games. Is there is no easy way out. There is always a way to win a game if you stay consistent and you stay in the game. And I thought that's what Queensland did. Um, I didn't think they were at their best. I don't think the two games at Queensland were at their best, but managed to crawl in there and you win by one point, it's still a win. Um, they take it to Cat Townsville and it'd be nice to see another sold out crowd for the women. I thought, you know, for them to be able to run out into a sold out crowd, it, it, it would lift them, definitely lift them and, and have good spirits when they're out there. So, yeah, another quality game. Uh, but yeah, Queensland come away with the win. I liked it. 11, 11 10. What a drop guy at the end, too. Outstanding performance by both teams in the trying conditions. It was torrential at times, some of the rain, but some of the skill, some of the football, some of the game awareness that some of these ladies play with is outstanding. It's first class. But uh, 
New South Wales, I thought, were the dominant side. Mm. But Queensland, never out of it, fought right to the end when New South Wales scored in the corner with you know, very little time left. And I thought that was it. That was the game done. Fortunately, it was wide enough for New South Wales to miss the kick. Mm. Kept them a score behind, a converted score. Queensland get the try. And then it's anyone's game. Then, unfortunately for Queensland, they get the drop goal and send it to Townsville. And the promoter's dream. It's a decider in the first ever yeah. three-game series. It goes down to the wire up in Townsville. And I'm sure just because of that, yeah. because it's a decider, it'll be a, it'll be a sellout up there. So it's a... Been a great series. Queensland still haven't clicked into gear. They've got a bit of work ahead of them. And New South Wales, I think, are still, whilst it's tied up, they've been the better side out of the two so far. So a bit of work to do for Queensland, but hopefully the home crowd up there can can help them get it done. Um, there's just one judiciary uh, issue with this game, which was Shannon Mato. I don't know if you guys saw the, the hair, hair pull. pull. Yeah. Oh. So at the moment, it's... She's up for one to two match ban, meaning that she will miss no. the game. But the player can elect to pay a four hundred dollar fine instead of the one match ban upon a guilty plea. Hey, Queensland will pay that. Yeah, of course. But man, only four hundred dollars. <laughs> that sounds so cheap compared to some of the other fines we're always hearing about. Well, the, these these women aren't full time. Yeah, uh, they're oh, not yeah, full time true. athletes. It's relative so, to the, what so, they're earning. So that's what the that's why it's so less compared to the men. Um, but for pulling hair, like. It's a hard one when you're playing against women and women have yeah. all got long hair. We see it in the men's game. I don't think no one gets fines for pulling hair in the men's game. I think Jerome Lewis, see, there was one. Yeah. Frizzell. Well, Frizzell. there was one on Jerome Lewis as yeah, well. Yeah, it was Nathan yeah. Brown. Yeah. On yeah. Nathan Brown, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it would be interesting to see what happens there. But I, I I wouldn't even – like you can't get a, a game on the sidelines for grabbing someone's hair, even in the men's game. Yeah. If that's how far we're going, it's a bit like – and I know we'll touch on later – the ball throw – Chanel Harris the Vita threw in the game and got ten minutes in. Like, come on, man! This is rugby <laughs> yeah. league. Like, we, both Willie and I used to play this game. Come on, you know what I mean? Like, some of these calls, I'm thinking, hold, oh, like that's not right. But yeah, I think Queensland will for, um will pay that surely up the Queenslanders. You got them. <laughs> oh, wow. Let's with that. Let's finally move off of Origin. How long have we been talking about it? I mean, that guy from the other week's probably going to oh. be pissed, man. <laughs> he's going to be angry oh, that we're cool. talking about Origin. He just wants to hear Warriors. Well, with that being said, <laughs> let's talk about the Dragons versus the Tigers. Um, <laughs> as the first NRL game of the weekend, uh, 56-14 to the Dragons. I mean, we talked about the Tigers before. This, another game where Zach Lomax, I mean, we could talk about him all day. Mm. 32 points broke the St. George Illawarra individual point scorer record with a hat trick of tries and 10 out of 10 from the tee. Wow. What yeah, between um, him, him and Ben Hunt, the two boys that backed up on that side, enormous effort. Um, yeah, I've seen him get into some space, Lomax, and I'm thinking, yep. you know, it hasn't been long since he's played a game. Watch those hammies, you know what I mean? Because I'm thinking, geez, I don't know how much recovery, or, I'm guessing he would have done a fair bit of recovery, but still... Like, he got into space a couple of times, and I'm thinking, oh, I don't know if he's going to pull a hammy here. I was worried for him. But he managed to get through the game, three tries, kicked all his goals. He was an important um, part of that team, alongside Ben Hunt. Um, you know, they that Tigers team, um, and I don't know what to say about those fellas. Um, the first, obviously, half, I think, that what, they're up 12-10, oh, 14-12 at half time, And there was patches in there that looked good. Again, we speak about them every week. That that second half was at forty four nil, in the second half. Never scored a try. Didn't look like scoring a try. No. Defensively woeful. Um, people getting sin bin and like you said at the top of the show, it's it's every week for them. Yeah, uh, it's every week. And I feel um, like I feel for for Benji as well because I, I again it's I guess for him he has to have a look in, at himself and figure out like he said he they spoke about discipline. They speak about this one and he said that he doesn't know how much more he can speak about it in the press conference. And I felt so because I'm guessing it's obviously some way or another, it's, the message isn't getting across. 
um, because it happens consistently week in, week out for those guys. And they put themselves under so much pressure because of all these silly things that they're doing, you know, fundamental mistakes, um, poor defensive tackles. Um, obviously, discipline has been poor for them, and it's been a trend for the since the, for the first first um, um, half of the competition. They they can't seem to buy a trick, but it's not sinking in. And like he said, if if it doesn't, if no one if no one's buying into it, then he's going to have to make changes. And well, you're going to have to make changes because I don't think anything's changed at the minute. Um, and you can't go another performance like that. But our competition is a tough competition. If you turn up unprepared or if you turn up not to want to do the hard work, um, then that's that's the result you're going to get. And I'm not I'm not saying that the Dragons are a poor team. I just think that they're not one of the top teams. So you imagine playing one of the top teams if you're playing a Melbourne Storm or a Penrith Panthers or a Cronulla Sharks on, the, on their day. It could have been 100 on them the way that the Tigers played. So... I real, really feel for, I guess, the organisations under the pump. Uh, players are wanting to leave. They're not performing to their best. Uh, the coaches been under the pump as well. They're struggling to get you know, any cohesion or any consistency in their performance and it's let down by a lot of the discipline. Yeah, Zach Lomax, outstanding, 32 points. Club record, franchise record now for, uh, for the new merge club. And Ben Hunt, you know, a lot of talk about those two and coming back. But there's a couple of other players too I thought were, were very good. Fytala Marin has been great for them this year. One who's been good, and I'm glad he has been because he's looked like he's got himself into a really fit state, is Moses Suli. Mm, yeah. Moses Suli looks really fit for once. A young kid that hit the scene early, um, I think it was about 19 at the Tigers, got a lot early when he probably didn't deserve it, didn't respect it, um, even at Manly. They tried to get him fit, kept having that challenge, but he's gone to St George. Looks like he's matured yeah. and grown and been a lot better for it. That break that he made to start the game and set up Zach Lomax for his yeah. first try, he's not only looking fit, but he's fast again. And a big, powerful thing, Moses Sulo. And hopefully he fulfills the potential that he has in his career and stays this way. His weight's always going to be a challenge. But if we stay focused and stay, stay hungry and stay in this shape, he's going to have a decent career. Um, but, yeah, the Tigers led when they scored at halftime. Just before halftime, I thought, oh, here we go. Tigers are going to give themselves a shout. But my concern for them in the second half, and this is always a concern for a coach and big alarm bells, is when there's some lack of effort. Mm. When there's some lack of effort, you know, you've got no choice but to make those changes. You know, the fundamental errors are coming off lack of concentration. And sometimes, as is the case with them, some of their um, sin binnings are shortcuts. And you've got to stay focused and be able to roll your sleeves up and stay in the grind. Because as Blairy said, if you want to compete with the top teams, you've got to do that. You've got to do that week in and week out. They're not even doing that. So, yeah, some big... Uh, some big decisions to be made for Benji coming up starting this week and what sort of team he rolls out next week because, yeah, that capitulation in the second half was really disappointing for them. I just don't know if they've got that much depth below what they have, you know. So that, that becomes another issue for Benji is that what is the quality behind what they've got? Because if they're picking their best players now, then you're bringing think, guys through the pathways. Are they ready to go into this... I guess this this area of pressure yep. uh, and can be able to perform because they're already under pressure. Um, so when he says makes changes, I don't see who comes in to change the results that they've already been getting. Uh, so that's my concern as well as yep. who is below those boys that are going to be better besides the guys that are injured, who is going to come in there and get a job done for Benji well, and get some wins? Especially uh, the Ruben Porter, I think is his name, made his debut off the bench for the Tigers. This yeah. week. I think he was their ninth debutant this season yeah. so far. So they've just been chucking all those new guys in there. And, I mean, obviously it hasn't worked out that great. This is, was their ninth loss in a row since they beat, the, not the Sharks, the Eels, since they well, beat the yeah. Eels. And so going on for, if they can hopefully win their game... <laughs> Well, Next week. Yeah, well, it affects, affects confidence in the players as well. And, again, if you, we speak about Lachlan Galvin, if, if you're not winning consistently, how do you feel like you're going to get better? 
You know what I mean? So you come into an environment where it's unsuccessful, you get out into the game and there's so much pressure already before you even get on the field, but then it's it's not helping your development. You're, you're not getting any better on the field because people around you aren't getting their jobs done or they're taking shortcuts. Then you're, you, you may go out there and try your ass off and it doesn't actually work for you because you're doing too much. So you're in a, you're not in a, in a good situation already. So I just think it's a, it's a tough position to come into if you're a young developing player and you've got high expectations. This is why there's people that want to leave because they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Moving on to the next game, Titans versus my Rabbitohs uh, at Seabus Super Stadium. 46-12 to the Rabbitohs and... What did I say? The grass is always greener on the other side. The Rabbitohs are back. Wayne Bennett's coming next year. I mean, premiership next year for the for the Bunnies. Uh, yep. But, yeah, pretty good performance from them, eh? After, you know, the, all the stuff they've been to, through, they finally got two wins on the bounce and Latrell Mitchell, holy, did he look good. Yeah, and, um, yeah, I guess there's been a lot of pressure on them as well through the start of the season, obviously losing the coach, second the coach. But the biggest thing for me, and I don't know why it's taken so long, Willie, is Cody Walker, Jack Wyden into the halves. Like, when Jack Wyden plays nice and straight, yep. it allows people to run the correct lines but with intent and intensity that they need to run them at. But it also actually attracts defenders. Um, so when they're playing well, is when those two guys are in the half. And then obviously Latrell comes on the back of that because what he ends up doing is those two those two halves create the opportunities for Latrell and the space out wide for him to be able to run into. Um, I thought he was he was the difference in that game. I thought the Titans were poor uh, compared to the standards of what they're normally used to playing at. I think defensively they weren't at their best and we've seen the Titans defend really well with guys out of position um, up, up against the towns, up against the Cowboys, up in Townsville, and defend their butts off. I just didn't see that against, you know, the Rabbitohs. I thought between those three guys and the guys around them, I thought, you know, they were they were quality, and that's what got them the win eventually in the end. And they were, they play tough. They look like the bunnies of old when those guys are, are playing football and they're consistent and they're on the field. Uh, Latrell obviously. There's there's op- there's an opportunity to be in New South Wales, the Origin team. Was that playing on his mind? Did he want to come out and put a big game in? I know he said that he he wants to focus on the Rabbitohs, which I think is was key. We said that he should be as well on this show. So I think between those three, they could really, well, now they're off the bottom of the table, they can really keep pushing going up here. they just got to be consistent now with their performances, those three. I thought their big fellas were good. Tom Burgess, David Boali, and uh, sung his praises last week and had a bit of a knock on him. Keon Kulamatangi, mm, yeah. thought he was very, very good again, finding some form. And off the back of their strong carries, I mean, strong through the middle, um, Damien Cook was able to get out early, set up Latrell. thing with Latrell for me is he was smiling all day. Yeah. Yeah, he looked happy. He looked like he was enjoying his footy again. But he had a, he was good in everything that he did. His subtlety of pass to set up a couple of tries. His running was dangerous again. Backing up, his work rate was busy, but his defence was good. And uh, Alufi Khan Pereira mm. is a flyer, and I gave him all the chances in the world to get around Latrell, but he just read the moment, just played it smart, assessed it, and cut him down. Defended him a couple of times, so yeah, he's back, back in a big way, and he's just got to stay happy. He's got to keep enjoying himself, and if he can block out some of the outside noise and some of the pressures, if you like that come with being Latrell Mitchell and being itself, then I think you can help him, you know, get another one. Because they're two in a row now. They're two in a row and they're growing in confidence. And I agree. Then we, we said Whiten in the halves with Cody Walker was always going to be dangerous. Co- Jack Whiten's run threat alone mm. is what makes him dangerous when he plays straight. So his ability and his strength to run and be a danger with ball in hand is what attracts the defenders in and he can play outside because he's smart enough. But yeah, hope that's got to be their combination for the rest of the season for mine. Yeah, I hope so too. I mean, that those two guys, especially they started carving even all the way to the end. They got those two tries, one for each of them right near the end of the game. For Latrell, I think, obviously, as a New South fan, would love to have him in that team. But I also don't begrudge him wanting to start, if he does still want to get the Rabbitohs back on track because of how promising these two wins have been. And if they can keep that up, I mean, that, that's that got to feel good for him as well. So 
I don't really mind what he chooses to do. Um, how about the... Um, Someone I want to talk about in this game, sorry, is uh, David Fafita. I was oh, about to say, oh, well, what, <laughs> what, about, what about that enormous battle? enormous at the back end of the game. And, and this is part of his issue. He's got it in him. Yeah. But he's got to have that from the moment he steps on the field every single time. You know, we don't get that enough out of him. And I, I presume that's why Billy Slater hasn't picked him. Because he's, he's got to do that consistently throughout games. He's got those moments. He's a game changer. Mm. And the way he trampled over Cody Walker, oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, well, if you can, like you said, if you can see that more consistently out of him, like, and I guess as a back row, you're always running at smaller defenders. So he's, he's hard to handle at the best of times. Yeah. Imagine him doing that consistently week in, week out to halfbacks. Um, mate, he, he could be damaging. And we've seen the try that he got. He was still 15, 20 metres out from the try line when he got that try. Like, he just lined him up. I love the battle. When it's always a battle when you're a halfback or a smaller defender and you're a back row because you just know that the big boys are coming straight yeah. at you. So when Fafita, David Fafita decides just to run hard at someone, he... No, you can't handle him. He, not even the bigger boys can handle him when he's running hard. He doesn't even need to use his feet at times. I think just run, David. Run over some of top, top of someone. And if he can do that consistently, well, he could be more than what he is now. Well, the first time he found him, he, he launched him in the air. The second time he trampled him. Yeah. So, yeah, and no, I just think, well, what a, what a battle that is. Um, and just touching back on um, Willie's one about Luttrell smiling. Um, you know, when players are happy, things are going well. Um, you know, it means your off field and your on field is is working out, and it's on you're on the same page and connected. So, um, we all know that rugby league is just a game, um, and the more you can go out there and have fun with what you do, the more you can get those kind of results. And people are smiling, so you know, keep smiling, bro, because whoo, <laughs> damaging that fella. Um, Jaden Campbell came back this game at I believe six. Was he more of a six or of a seven with? Kieran Foran, and he was he was pretty good in that position. I mean, how do you guys feel about him maintaining that when Brimson eventually comes back? Yeah, well, I think he's. I think he can convert him. Well, they got what three fullbacks? <laughs> yeah. They got three: Jaden, Brimson, and Kenny. Keanu, yeah. you know Keanu Kenny. So someone's got to um, go into the halves. Um, so I think Jaden's most probably the best one because I do like. Um, Brimson at the back, I think, what he can do, and we've spoken about him already, but I think Jaden Campbell's got great ball-playing abilities. He's fast. Um, I know when he, I saw him one time he played the Warriors once, he got off of scrum and just got to the outside of someone really quick. That's what he can do. He, can, he moves along the ground. He's a tough defender. Like You're in the front line now. I think he can defend in the front line, so I like what he can do. I think he's mostly the one that's going to kind of move into that, that sixth spot um, because I like Brimson at the back. Yeah, sweet. Um, I was just going to touch on having fun. You know, David Fafita seemed pretty quiet most of the game, but um, I like the back and forth between him and Cody Walker. You know, it didn't seem like it was negative. It was this real sort of fun thing, but it was like, where was that for most of the game? Kind of that sparked him up right at the end. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. the question everybody wants answered out of David Fafita because... Everybody knows how good he can be, but I, I also want to know what Cody Walker did to poke the bear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe they yeah. don't want to do that because that's what he can do. Yeah. You know, you don't want to get in a little bit of a tussle with Fafita because if you get him angry, that's what he can deliver for them. So it may be a, a conversation with the coach, the Titans coach, you know, and having a chat. So, David, what can we do to get that out of you yeah. consistently yeah. week in, week out? So, again, it's like you're, you're learning about your players as well as a coach. You're learning about what makes them tick. And these are the things that they've got to work out with David is what makes David play well when he's yeah. at his best and how can we get yeah. – obviously not the, the – the carry on, but the quality in the carry on of what he does. Um, and if we can get that out of you consistently week in, week out, then you'll see a lot more performance, consistent performance from Fafita and what he can do. So, be a great, great little, um, be good to be a fly on the wall there and him sitting down with Hasley and having a chat around, you know, David, what can we do to get that out of you yeah, yeah. consistently? So, I think, you know, as a coach, you'd want to know what how you can help a player. And I think. Sitting down and having a chat wouldn't be something that. Do you, do you think he's just do. content with? Yeah, well, how, I think his he, situation yeah. now, how he just 
when he wants to, he turns it on, and yeah. when he's not, he's just like, oh, yeah. I, I definitely think that could be part of it. I think he just knows that he's big and strong, and he doesn't have to do it all the time. But when there's moments, he comes in. And so I think, yeah, I think sometimes he just knows that he's yeah. mostly big and strong and good, and he can do these things, but he picks his times. He doesn't actually do it consistently. And when the team's mostly under the most pressure, is mostly when you want someone like him to be the game breaker. You're looking for someone to break up in a game. And it's I'm, I'm assuming when you know the game's on the line, Karen Foran will go to him more often than not. You know, Jaden yeah. Campbell would go to him more often than not, and find David Fafita because they know what he can do. So he's a game breaker. So I feel like sometimes I just think he's content with what he can do, without being the man on the field. And but I think when the, the game's on the line, the Titans go to David Fafita to win the game. Sweet. Think Here's our mate. People have. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> waited long enough, eh? I guess we'll just hop straight into the game that everyone's probably waiting to listen to your guys' thoughts on. Cowboys versus Warriors at Queensland Country Back. 42-12 to the Warriors, man. They're back. Three in a row. Three in a row. Impressive stuff from the Warriors. Yeah, it was a quality game. I thought the Warriors were, yeah, they were tough. Um, you know, between... if. You know, if you look at their pack at the start of the week, you know, it's right up there with some of the top packs in the competition, if not one of the top packs. Um, you know, Adam Fanua Blake, um, Jackson Ford now moving from the back row, I think has been a, a massive change up for the Warriors. I think he's been quality through the middle of the park and what he's done. He's real really I guess Coach Webbs has really simplified the his uh, game and his detail around his game about just getting that ball using your leg speed over the over the line and getting down and playing the ball quick. Um, he's he's tough through the middle of the park. He can play big minutes. I think he plays 60 minutes straight. Um, you know, and then you you got someone like that to help Adam Fanua Blake and do what he can do. We all know what Adam does. Wade Egan was back. It's nice to see Wade back on the field. And then you got Dylan Walker, who I think has been most probably the most consistent in that middle pack just for the last three weeks that he's got his opportunity to start the, start the game. I think between... Those guys, they've been able to unleash Tamari Martin and, and Chanel Tavita Harris uh, with what they can do out wide between, you know, the two centers, Rocco Burr and Adam Pompey, and obviously Dallin and Marcel out on the wing. And then Chan's been back in there as well, has actually added more of a threat all over the park for me. I feel like when, you know, and we all obviously know that when Sean's there, they were one dimensional. It felt like, you know, they were just going down their right hand side. Teams can read that. Now, I think with the two halves that they have and, and the spine and the middle forwards, what they've been able to create is that they're scoring on both sides of the field. It doesn't matter. And through the middle of the yep. park, they're threats everywhere. So really liked what they did off, off the back of their two big performances without some of their stars, but then getting a couple of the guys back to strengthen up what they have already, uh, but also just to kick on from their performance. They come up against a... I guess the Cowboys pack that is playing for a bye. They're the only team in the comp that hasn't had a bye yet, and they looked tired, they looked fatigued, they didn't look like they had too much energy. There was moments here, obviously, dead and what he can do, and Scott Drinkwater trying his butt off. I think he's been, if not one of their better players, between him and dead and um, try to stand up and try to pull them out of the tough times. But I think, you know, that I didn't think the Origin players. They look tired as well. The players around them mostly didn't give them a hand with energy and lifting their energy up. So, you know, a quality performance from from the Warriors, uh, much needed consistency and effort that they needed to keep kicking on. Um, toughest time of the year now. It, it's been able to like kick on to the back end of the season. I think they've got one more buy. They're very lucky that they've got a buy round last round of the comp, which does help. Um, but they're playing again. They've got to go again and go up another gear. I, I, I thought the real mark and improvement for the Warriors was their physicality. I thought they were physical and wanting to take on the challenge head-on against the against the Cowboys on the weekend. And that was epitomised when uh, Adam scored his try. He left uh, Griffin Neem on the ground and a couple of other defenders. And he got up and did these ones and said, yeah, who's going to carry me? Who's going to stop me? Mm. Try it. And that had an effect when uh, Barnett scored his try. Because he ran so hard and it's playing so direct and straight at the line, the back row for the Cowboys, Helam Lukey, had to come and bite real hard. So when they played out the back, Barnett just walks in. But yeah, their threats are now across the park, genuinely, genuine threats. And that's dangerous for teams to defend against. The growth in the team the last couple of weeks has been enormous. And wasn't so long ago, 
We were talking about them in a rut and haven't, hadn't won a game in a month or mm. five weeks. They'd gone winless. And we said, you know, get a couple of wins and you put that all behind you. You forget about all that. That's where they're at. They've just got to keep that consistency, keep that hunger, keep that desire and keep that form going because they're in a, in a really, really dangerous place now, the Warriors. And they're back to being a threat to the other teams and whoever they play, starting with Melbourne this week. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's also the back rowers for me too. Mitch Barnett's doing a really good job, but it's nice to have Marata near quarterback. Um, he makes a big difference. I know they try to use him through the middle of the park. I just didn't think that worked. Um, but what's worked is obviously the Jackson Ford move. I think that worked better for the Warriors. But I also say now that having him out on the, on the edges, every time he carries the ball, you have to put your body in front of this guy because they're playing nice and direct. I like their shape. It's similar to the shape. It's pretty much the same shape as they ran last year, but everything's just running nice and hard yeah. and straight. Um, which makes defensive teams have to make a decision. You've seen the, the try from Rocco Berry. That's playing through the opposition, not trying to go around yeah. them. The first try, they went at the back. Someone got pulled up for a, a, a infringement or something, and I thought it should have been a try, but it wasn't a try. Yep. They go to the next option. They play nice and straight through them. That's, that, those are the tries you want to see is that they're, they're nice and direct. Back rows are scoring tries. Adams just coming back through the middle, using his feet, using his strength. But yeah, so that's all created from the forward momentum and then being able to just run nice and flat the direct shape. Yeah. That, that's what's, that's what's going to work for the Warriors with the bodies that they have and the players that they have on the field. It's the direct shape and running that will that'll get them over the line more often than not. And like you said, defence. Obviously, we all know defence wins competitions. Keep having that defensive mindset and attitude to go after the opposition and, and getting stuck into them. And that's like it. you said, that was, that was solid. I thought they were really good. You mentioned it uh, a bit earlier, the controversial double sin bin. A uh, little bit of a, one of those with the ball, later bowl, and then the other guy, I oh, might as well send you off to both you guys in the bin. What did you think of that? Would have been mean if he just done a little Kobe. <laughs> 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 Do you reckon he would have got sent off for that? Oh, mate, that was just as bad as, yeah. Uh, I've seen some, no, I haven't seen too many bad calls when it comes to, like, sending people off to the bin. But, man, that was poor. I, you know, it was funny. My little fellow was watching it and he said, I think the ref should have been <laughs> sent himself off. <laughs> My little one's only seven years old. So, <laughs> hey, he, don't get him wrong. He doesn't know what he's on about. But he, that's, he, he's so passionate about the game as well. And I'm just thinking, wow, you know, like, that was a, a bizarre decision to send people off. I know there was some heated moments in there, but again, there's so many heated moments in the game of rugby league now. It's all push and shove anyway. No one can touch anyone. You can't hit anyone. So um, he wanted to prove a point. His point was, hey, you, you got to go sit on the sideline. But that incident just wasn't it wasn't the right call for me. If the game was scrappy and the referees feel like he's losing a bit of control and he had to exert his power back on the game again, to get control back, then maybe. But the game wasn't that way. It was just a, a moment of madness between both teams. Yeah. And now there was one a couple of days earlier where Ben Hunt scored the try and he threw it on uh, Sai Fainu, I think, from yeah. the Tigers, just threw it on when he was on the ground. The referee's standing right there and he, whoa, 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 calm down, yeah, calm yeah. down. And that's all the referee had to do in the Cowboys game. Just said, well, hey, you guys, calm down, Chanel. Do that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Warning. But first time, it wasn't even a, a big throw. Yeah. It just dropped the ball almost. <laughs> and yeah, I, th I thought he realised that it was a poor decision to send him the, okay, I'll make up for this by sending someone from the Cowboys. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. And even it up. Oh, mate, yeah, no. Nah, that... yeah, it was poor from the start. That was definitely an interesting one. Uh, just one more question about the Warriors. So obviously, I think Sean Johnson's going to be back this week, right? Ooh. Maybe not, whatever. When he does come back, Tamaire has been so good for them while he's been the seven. How do they get his form continuing when he goes back to six next to Sean Johnson? Yeah, I think um, whenever Sean comes back, I think um, he's got to realise that he has to support someone like Tamaire. Um, and I think it's similar to what, I guess, Cody Nikorima does for Zaya Katoa at at the Dolphins, he allows his eye to do what he does, but supports him by being that guy around the back to give him that that shape on on the long side or the long side shifts. Because wow, how they play, they obviously play uh, Tamari and Sean on the ball, but on the ball for Tamari at the moment is swinging both ways of the field. 
Um, and then obviously having having Chanel at the back of some shape, of some of those block shapes that are running some good shapes and, and Chans as well. So I think Sean has to find a way to bring Tamari into the game more often than not. Um, understand that, you know, his kicking game is quality. But we've seen the Warriors um, last three weeks kick both sides of the field. They're, they're, they're not just kicking to the one side, um, which I like because I think, you know, obviously I know Rocco Berry does a really good job of chasing down there and that side chases really well. But I think there's opportunities for, for both teams to be able to do that. I guess if you're, you're game planning and you're strategizing on what winger likes coming off what side, then I get that as, as a coach and you want to put someone in the corner because they're better off coming from that side than this side. But I think the way that he can help others, understanding that, he doesn't have that much longer in the game. Um, he needs to be able to guide these new new guys through the next generation of Tamari and Chanel into a position where they can play the way that they have been playing. So a really hard decisions to make come come time Sean come, comes back. But what they what Coach Webster does have is has some trust in what they have right now, uh, which is these guys can get a job done without Sean. If he's not even a hundred percent. Just keep him on the sideline for as long as you can, uh, because there's no point rushing him. Uh, we know he's a ge- big game player. We know what Sean can do, but there's trust now in the guys that we have on the back of keeping everyone injury free. This middle forward pack, then these guys are able to do their thing. So, working with Tamari rather than trying to take over the whole thing, it would be my suggestions. Yeah, and between now, oh. And after, straight after the Cowboys game, and whenever Sean comes back, reps for those two will be important in training. So they get that understanding. The trust is there, as Blair is saying, from the coach and those players. Wade Egan's got to have the trust as well now in the halves that he's playing to and be able to trust that he can play both sides because he was very pass dominant to Sean's side predominantly when he was there. But because of the way things have gone and how good tomorrow has been going... Hey, play to both sides now. We're talking about you're a genuine threat on both sides of the field. Expose those threats. Use those threats up on both sides. So, yeah, Sean, Sean will fit in. He's still got a big part to play mm. in this side being as great as it can be. He's just got to find a way to fit in with Tamaiti and vice versa. The last thing about this game is a thing on the Cowboys I've noticed in recent weeks <clears throat> from watching their games is it seems to me like they never – contest kicks the only ones they ever contest is those like the ones from when they've pushed all the way to the line and you know they'll kick it to Nanai and he can get that's how he has so many tries but whenever they kick from like outside the 30 but it's a bomb they just bomb it up and the guys get there in time but they just stand there do do you know why they do that um I would have said something like that for the Warriors at the start of the year as well is that with Sean's kicking game, a lot of the times you just see Rocco Berry get down there and just stand in front away from the catch and then land on it. I guess it's part of the systems and structures that they do. But I think of late, in maybe the last five weeks, I thought they were actually jumping up and trying to compete for the ball. Because at worst, at worst you knock it on and it's a play the ball. It's a play the ball. At best, you go up, you can test, you catch the ball and you score a try, or you pass it to your mate and, and he drops it or something like that. So the best case scenario, you jump up, you compete, you catch the ball, you score a try. Worst case is you knock it on, hopefully it doesn't go into their hands and they run the length, but knock it on, and then it's a it's a handover play of the ball. Um, I'm thinking there's some uh, Warriors coaching staff in the Cowboys as well um, who may have taken some <laughs> of the stuff that the Warriors yeah. have done last year uh, and, and used that in, in their systems as well because I think... What worked for the Warriors last year would, would would still work now, and I think they would have taken some of those stuff. Uh, Morgan's over there now, Michael Morgan. Mm. Michael Morgan. Uh, Justin. <laughs> Justin. Justin. Michael Morgan. Justin Morgan. Doing my trick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just, Justin Morgan's over there, who was the defensive coach slash mostly everything else at, at, the, at the Warriors last year, and he may have taken some of that mentality with him. Um, but I, I think, you know, if you're in the space and you're there early enough to compete, then we've got a good enough wingers these days or centers that can jump up and compete. So, yeah, it's a strange one for me because I always think, yeah, get up and have a crack. Um, yes, there's that new rule of, you know, putting your hands up and... Disruptor. Like, disruptor. There's a disruptor rule. But, like I said, if you can get down there early enough, I think there's always an opportunity to compete for the ball. So I don't know why they're doing it. It may be something that they took off the Warriors... Back in the day. 
I love the competition on a kick. I love the contest in the air. Uh, we saw it. Lomax Crichton. Yeah. yeah it was, Far. Yeah. Crichton was outstanding when he <laughs> um, got up. They almost scored the dogs and the referee just called Howard. But those are the rewards. Um, mm. As Blair said, you got tackled, come back, it's a handover. That's where it would have been tackled anyway. So you lose nothing from the competition. This is why I don't like this disruptive rule because it's taken away that element of the game a fair bit. You see, you don't see half as many contests for kicks as there used to be because of the rule and it scared people off. But yeah, you're not going to lose much. I, there is a tactic, especially near the sideline, and the Warriors did it, where they caught Kyle Felt, let him catch the mm. ball, hold him up, drag him into yeah. touch. If it's close enough to the touchline, it's a great ploy. But uh, yeah, I, I think more often than not, coaches are employing that chase down, let him, let him catch it, and boom. Probably the best exponent of that is uh, Liam Martin. He's great for that mm. at Penrith. He times his, his, his tackles perfectly. He almost reading where as soon as he's going to catch the ball, boom, he's on he, him. He also jumps up and competes too. Sometimes, so yeah. So he, he, he's got a good awareness on where to like just crash and tackle yep. or get there early enough that he can compete. And I've seen him go up for balls as well. So he's got it perfectly timed at the minute. Yep. I haven't seen him get it too many times wrong. Moving on to the Sharks versus the Broncos. And the Sharks were able to do it again like a few weeks ago when they beat the Storm without Hines. Obviously, Broncos without Reese Walsh as well. Um, it was a second-half comeback again. I mean, man, the Sharks are pretty weird at the moment. They win these hard games and then they lose in impressive fashion other games. Uh, yeah. As much as well as the Broncos are a bit weird with their performances too because... Yeah. You know, they lost to the Titans and miserably uh, the Broncos bogey team, I think. The Titans always seem to work them out and, and get wins over them. But again, backing up after Origin, some of those boys, you know, needed more help around the middle of the park. With all, what they had, Payne Huss was enormous. He tried his butt off. He worked hard. You know, Paddy Garrigan's always in and around everything. I just didn't think, um, you know, they were they were – good enough to beat a Cronulla Sharks that were hungry to go after the the Broncos when I guess if you know that our team's got origin players backing up and you're a team like the Sharks who only have Nico Hines in there like you can switch your mindset and let's just go after this team and put pressure on them defensively with our with our defense but also with our carries as well as well Royce Hunt yep. um Obviously, paying for a contract, uh, you know, when Royce Hunt's um, going well, you see some of those those things there. Rabbitohs might be wanting to, <laughs> to take him. Uh, Wayne Wayne might be looking at um, getting him over to Rabbitohs. But between between him, Mulitalo, Trindle, I thought he was enormous. Um, they were in Katoa. They're, they're, back, they're back three. Uh, you know, they're back five are strong, strong carries. Well, they're, they're most really their, their strength. Yeah. And when those guys go forward, it allows Trindle to do what he does. Uh, it also brings everyone into the game. So um, another a solid performance from Sharks. They are still trying to find some consistency with trying to beat these top teams. Um, but they came out firing here and went after the, the Broncos and, and put them to the sword. Yeah, I thought they were good second half in particular. I felt sorry for Tristan Saylor. A couple of drop balls, drop catches that led to tries. But that showed the urgency from the Sharks. Yeah, I agree. I thought uh, Royce Hunt was outstanding. So was Sifa Talakai. Yeah. He was mm -hmm. a bundle of energy on that edge and strong, powerful, took his try well. But I thought defensively the Broncos were, were a bit off. You know, uh, Pierre Kuro made a bad read when, yeah. when Trindle scored his try, just got on his inside shoulder, overread the play. Trindle walks in. Uh, one of the Brilliant pieces of play was uh, Sione Katoa off the scrum. His right foot step on, on Cobo was yeah, outstanding. Got him just a beauty. Broke his ankles <laughs> and, and went in for a try. And they finished the game really strongly. So they showed a bit of resistance and a bit of resilience to come back against the Broncos' start. But uh, yeah, they've got a. They've beaten a big side, but not at full strength. Yeah. That'll be their test when they come up against a side that's at full strength. That's uh, going to be a contender. We said that before when they lost to Penrith, 42-0. Didn't get the win the week after when they needed to. Um, they've still got to, they're still in that position where they've got to prove themselves. For their outside backs, um, the two wingers and the centres, 
running meters in this game were pretty crazy. So Kartor had 158, Mulutalo had 187, Ramian 190, Iro 183. Like, man, those, I, I think what you said, the keys to the team pretty uh, much. That's always been the shark strength is, is their back five. Um, they are hard to handle, but they, they're competitors. They, they, you know, Ronaldo, you've seen him mouthing off of um, Di Marine. It's, it's always a competition with him. Um, he loves it. it. It makes him who he is. He's unique to what he does, but he, you know he's going to put himself in the pitch every time. If there's, if there's a one-on-one battle, winger versus winger, or anyone actually, to be honest, He's in their face letting them know. And I think between those five guys, you know, it's nice seeing him playing some consistent football because he's, you know, he's been there or thereabouts a lot of the times. Now he's playing some football in the position that he's comfortable in and looks good. I think between those guys, yeah, strong back five. Hard team to handle when those guys are going forward and they're having a bit of fun. Uh, question for the halves of the Sharks. I'm, I heard you guys both say about Trindle, and yes, he's good, but obviously Atkinson also mm. good. Who do you think should be that partner with Nico Hines? Well, I think Trindle. I think Trindle was there from the start. Nico Hines and Trindle have a great relationship. Um, they play through the Indigenous All-Star stuff as well, and I thought they were outstanding that day as well against the Māori team. Um, so they've kind of built that relationship through. They, when they're together, they play well. I think, yeah. you know, Nico's obviously... Was, didn't back up after this game, but I think you know you've got a great replacement of Atkins and who can who you know is uh, a consistent performer and can get a job done. But I think when you look at you know Trindle and Nico Hines, I think that's most probably their best combination. Yeah, they're the senior combination as well. They worked all the way through preseason, got themselves a start to the year. Uh, it was an indiscretion off the field that took Trindle out of the game. Yeah. It seems to have been settled now. He's back in it. I think him and him and Nico, they strike up that combination again. Atkinson will be do well as that replacement. Eh? Um, Storm versus Knights next game at Amy Park, thirty six twenty eight to the Storm. I, man, I thought the Storm were just going to run away mm. with it, but the Knights actually did hold on, even though they're pretty down on troops. David Armstrong had that quad thing, uh, so he was ruled out late. Fletcher Sharp got his debut, mm. and they. They did all right. Obviously, lost the game, but they did do the fight well against the Storm. Yeah, I, I thought the same as what you're saying. I thought the Storm would be able to just look after the Knights quite easy down at home, Amy Park, you know, full stadium. Um, but the Knights turned up uh, with the, with a great attitude. Um, they they got some few bad calls against them, but again, we, when we look at the the Storm, they just get it they just know how to win these games even when they're not at their best and that's much really the most annoying thing for 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 teams is that the storm don't always have to be at their best but they find ways to win games and th- if you go through their team there's some quality players even though they're missing a few players as well um but again jerome hughes is a big key to what the storm do um and they're coming up this week and i don't want to talk about the storm and, and the warriors but <laughs> Jerome Hughes, every time he plays the Warriors, seems to have a huge game and fuse, an impact on what the result is. Um, but those guys, you know, Wishart, I thought, you know, tough. He's a tough carrier of the ball. He, he's obviously kind of like a, a, a Ben Hunt mould, you know, shorter to the ground, but, you know, looks for his opportunities, always involved, finds his way in the game. Um, you know, I thought even to the end, I didn't think, you know, Storm were going to win there because Newcastle were there or thereabouts. I like, um, obviously, the debutant. I've watched him through SG Ball last year. Kind of reminds me of Pappenhausen, the way that he runs and plays. If um, I watched a lot of his SG Ball clips. Um, never really sat at the back of shape. He just sat around the middle of the ruck and he has that little mullet going as well. So, I don't know. <laughs> like, he actually runs exactly the same as him, carries himself in the same similar manner. So, um, a great, you know, game for him as well. It's great to see. He's another the fullback so they've got three three there as well so I'm guessing they locked them all in because they can play much probably anywhere from centre wing to fullback you know what I mean so a great little uh, d- debut for him as well but yeah the result just didn't go the, the night's way yeah Jerome Hughes is an outstanding footballer you know when he's got his ball got the ball in his hands whether it's kicking or running plays a couple of times he made some really good decisions to go down short sides to set up a couple of breaks there was uh, the one where he got Nick Meany away in the first half, and then the second half there was a play where they had a four and four, and he just called Sua Fa'alongo to come down late. Mm. He didn't even have to show it to Sua. 
But the fact that Sewell was there, he held the four man up the back rower through the long the ball, center. the cut out to the center. They just got the two on one on the edge and ended up scoring. Just, just a really smart football brain on on Jerome Hughes to assess situations quickly and make the right play and get people in the right positions for him to exert his plays and his dominance on the opposition. Melbourne were very, very good again. But yeah, Newcastle, they fought. They fought all the way through. And I thought uh, Dan Gagai was strong for them every mm. time he touched the ball. And I'm still going to shout for him for Queensland somewhere, but it's hard to get him in when they're winning. But yeah, he's, he was very, very good across the park. Jackson Hastings had the ball in his hands, was a, was a pest again, Jacko. <laughs> um, causing some trouble getting in the ears of the opposition. But, yeah, they're, they're, a, ty- they're a team that toil and fight and are never going to go away, the Knights. that they, they just need to get some of their big guns back. Mm. Um, Tyron Wishart, as you brought up before, he's a, he's very versatile. He, I think he's played in this season Emily. alone in every position in the backs for the Storm. But obviously he's second choice behind people like Munster uh, in the fullbacks. Mm. They have... Plenty of those guys, centres, wings. He's not really the first decision for any of those positions. Mm. Do you think he might be on his way out of the storm to get like the chance to be a gun for another team? Or yeah, well, w- whenever you get an opportunity to do what you do on the big stage, you've got to perform at your best consistently all the time. Um, you're one, you know, opportunity away from getting another one. Um, so understanding that you got to make the most of everything that you do when you're out on the field. So, yeah, if, if a club sees that it fits their club and you can put in performances that show clubs that you can play at this level and you can play consistently and you can do what you can do, then, yeah, you're you're an opportunity away from getting a tap on the shoulder saying, hey, if you're not going to play first grade down here, then we have an opportunity for you. And I guess you only leave if you've got an opportunity to play first grade. You're not leaving the storm if you're just going to play in the reserve grade. So, yeah, I think he's a quality player. I think he could fit into any side if they seem that he can fit in, seem deemed that, oh, deemed that they can fit into him. Fit in there. Yeah. Fit into him. <laughs> fit into him. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Yeah, what was that? Fit into Is he a hooker? Him. Yeah, he's played hooker as well. He's, is that his predominant not, position? I think he started <laughs> what, what off as a hooker solely. But That's what I thought. Now um, he's played everywhere else yeah, pretty much. He's got to find out what he wants to be first and work out where he can fit in. But the Melbourne, <laughs> as I said, him. Melbourne, Roosters and right. Penrith, if you play first grade for them and you're playing every single week, you'll pretty much get a job somewhere else. Mm. Guaranteed you'll play for one of the other teams week in and week out. So I, if he can stay there for another year or two and cement himself there and be happy to be that filler because he's invaluable to them at the moment playing everywhere and he started loads of games, yes, in different positions, but nonetheless he's been out there starting. He can say that for the Melbourne Storm. So he'll pick up a job somewhere else on the back of that. Because also there's a chance, you know, Munster might leave in coming years at some point when he's still there and... If he wants to take that sixth, you know, other guys in the back line might leave as well. He could become the next Storm legend or whatever, whatever. <laughs> however you guys consider the Storm players. Moving on to the next game, uh, Panthers versus the Sea Eagles at Blue Bet. 32-22 to 22 to the Panthers. And man, Garrick, what happened to your boots, bro? He was missing every kick. They could have been two points in this game, but he only hit one out of five conversions. But yeah, it was mainly just down to the main man, Brian Toto. <laughs> well, I think what it was, a beast. Yeah, it was um, six tries to five in the end. Yeah. So kicking was a big difference in the game, and I, I think it could have gone either way. I think between, like you said, the the wingers, all the, the both wingers. I was wanting someone to break a record, like you know, it looked like Talal was going to get it real yeah. early. Yeah. Uh, you know, hat trick real early, four tries. I was hoping five, maybe six. And then Tor on the other side is scoring tries and Taruva comes in and starts scoring tries. So I think it was it was a day for the wingers done because of the stuff that we're doing through the middle of the park, but then creating opportunities at what if, if wingers are scoring, then you're doing a good job through the middle of the park and making um, people make decisions. So um, 
know, I didn't think, you know, obviously they played at home. There's not too many games uh, that the Panthers lose back to back at home. And they were wanting a big performance. I know that they would have had a lot of numbers and fans there. there. But I think, you know, what the Panthers can do, it doesn't matter who steps into the spot. They just fit into the system. They get the systems right and everyone just plays their role. They're not a Nathan Cleary who goes in there and leads the team around. They're their individual player. But between them, they understand. I thought the two front rowers started the game really well. Moses Lealta and James Fisher-Harris, I thought they were enormous for those guys. And then, obviously, on the back of that, they've been able to score those tries and, um, you know, win the game. But, yeah, six tries to five. Like, I didn't think Manly were bad. It's just if you could get those kicks, it would have put some scoreboard pressure on both, on the other opposition. It's been a great pickup, Tommy Talau, for Manly, from, from the Tigers. It probably came... As a bit of a spare part, if you like, and I know that's being disrespectful a little bit, but he was probably going to be the backup centre, backup winger. Through injuries, he found himself in, uh, in first grade, playing on the wing, um, took his opportunity with both hands, had a couple of games at centre, back out on the wing now, and he's been fantastic. He's been great for, for the Sea Eagles mm. this year and um, probably got him a little bit cheaper than what he would have been a couple of years ago so he's been one of those when I'm talking about value for money who's living overs for them and doing a great job to take his hat trick and take it well and he did a really good job but I thought on the other side Brian Tuttle's hat trick he had a little bit more work to do mm. for some of those some of the passes weren't on the money and some of his composure to reach out and grab some of the passes regather beat defenders roll over and get the tries down He's such a smart, smart winger. We talk about his strength and his work rate, but he's a very, very clever winger to boot, defensively and with the ball in hand. I mean, but the Penrith Panthers, uh, they, they're clicking into gear. They just know when to get it done. And granted, uh, the scoreboard pressure was eased a little bit with the missed kicks from Garrick, but yeah, they're, uh, they're just a methodical side that keep doing what they do and everybody knows their jobs. Everybody, whoever slots into the back row, they know what their job is. They know where they need to be and how to run their assignments and they they do it more often than not better than others. A bit like Dan Laurie, Dan Laurie's performance. Dan Laurie. You know, he ain't no Dylan Edwards, but what he did was pretty similar to what Dylan Edwards does when he plays for the for the Panthers, just in his own way. Um, you know, what was it, 340... 344 metres. 344 metres. Like, that's enormous. And he's mostly second string, maybe third, fourth string in there. But gets on the field in a good system, knows their role, know, know their role, know their job, gets it yep. done. And, you know, he was enormous. I know there was, there was big raps on him. Um, it's, there's always been big raps on him. He'd come in and he got a job done for the Panthers. And, you know, they'll be excited. They, I don't know they've got some players that are sitting on the sideline, but man, what they have right now is going really well for them. Some big... Uh Pivotal, pivotal game for some of the stats leaders. Uh, so Sione Katoa in the game before had got 13 tackle breaks and was about to catch Brian Toto. And then Brian Toto got 13 and yeah. put his lead at top of tackle breaks in the NRL. I think he got 100. In the, I think he got 100. He's, he's 100 for the season. I think they rem removed some. Removed some. The ones where you, <laughs> just, where you just touch them and they oh. call that a, some of the Some of the <laughs> rolling on some of these things... <laughs> You just have to touch someone and it's yeah. a tackle break. I'm like, come on, bro. He's actually has to, someone has to actually attempt to tackle him and wrap the arms around yeah. for him to get out. <laughs> so he's, he's 16 up above second place, Katoa. And oh. then at the try leaders, there's three of them now with two in this game. Tommy Talau and Taruva both went up to 11 to tie it up with uh, Mike Asivo, who didn't play. So oh. it's heating up. Like last season, I remember it was pretty exciting getting towards the end with Dallin and uh, Jermaine. Yeah. And those boys competing, I mean, there's going to be maybe another one this season. Um, but yeah, Haumule was Calf. injured. Calf. Yep. Don't know what that's going to be. TBC on how long it could be or if he's going to be out of origin and stuff like that. How big would that be? Or oh, how long are calf injuries usually? Have? It all depends on how bad it was. I think I think coach pulled him off. I think I listened to that press conference. He pulled him off when it tightened up so and didn't put him back on because he said it wasn't there was no use of putting him back on and making it worse. So they might have got it early where it didn't actually pull too much. Um, so maybe a week, two on the sidelines, you'll be ready for Origin. You'll need him back there because I thought he was pretty good too when he come on off the bench. Do you think if he's in contention here for New South Wales that 
Michael Maguire rings Anthony Seabold. Yeah. Any way you can put him on ice for yeah. me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and I'm guessing Seabold had the same thinking in his mind as well. It's like, well, we're not going to make it any worse. Um, I'm taking him off because he's mostly thinking bigger picture for him as well. And as a Queenslander, do you think Anthony Seabold helps him out? <laughs> yeah, you would think so, eh? You would think so. No, but get back on. <laughs> um, and in judiciary, I just wanted to talk about this because we talked about it before. Hair pull. The Nathan Brown hair pull. Uh, that one is 1800 to $2,500 fine for him. But it's not a, it's not a week on the sidelines. Nah, like a, the no, other no one. ban for him. But th- that's just the that's just the fine. But then Josh Alloy uh, did a trip, and he has two to three matches banned. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's second offence for Nathan Brown, and still doesn't doesn't get a week anyway. And then Shannon Mato mm. is a one to two. Did you say first offence? Um, first offence. Yeah, one to two. One to two, or four hundred dollars. Yeah. It, it doesn't make it doesn't make oh. sense. It just doesn't make sense. Second offense, like this is her first one. She's gonna get a if she says no to the four hundred, she gets a week. And this follows Nathan Brown's done two, and he only gets a fine. So yeah, this is I yeah. and this is the confusion I yeah. I don't get is that there's there's different gradings for everything and different understandings for there, there's no black and white it's, oh, there's a lot of confused, confusion around everything you do like I don't understand how hers is a week to two if she, if she takes a but if she can take the fine it's nothing this one he doesn't even get it doesn't get mentioned a week or two but it's a second offence so this is where I just get confused so um, yeah I don't understand how it works um, I'm guessing a fine does, does it for me but again, like, hey, get along. I yeah. totally get that Nathan Brown was accidental. He came out of the scrum and just grabbed, I presume he was grabbing Jerome, the jersey. Jerome but Lewis. Jerome Lewis jersey, but he grabbed some hair. And he looked almost apologetic instantly when he did it. So I, I get that from him that it was an, an accident. But, yeah, the difference in the yeah. gradings for the two What's, yeah, confusing I yeah, me too. It doesn't... If you First offence, you'd think, would be a lot nothing. lighter, yeah. It's just a warning. Just a 400, maybe, yeah, or just 200. Just a 400, yeah. The only yeah. thing I Did will it? say is I'm not an expert on the rule book difference. Maybe there's a difference in the rules for NRLW because obviously way more of the women have longer hair. Maybe there's something in that. I'd, yeah, yeah I but like a, a fine would would be necessary then. Yeah. If, if, but I wouldn't, why, why one to two? That, yeah. that, that's what I'm trying to say is that this is where the confusion is, is that... He doesn't even get mentioned one to two weeks. It, all it is is a fine. Like if if she just got a fine, then everyone we wouldn't be. We'll have to come it. up with an answer. Yeah. yeah. We'll uh, find, when's we'll the figure. rest? Did the, they already do their breakdown? Nah, surely the breakdown's on today. Oh, yeah. With everything else, because it's Tuesday, it's everything's quite so, late here, my bro. Adam will be waiting by his uh, phone. phone. He's going to be wanting an Teamless answer to these Tuesday. questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to Brian Tor, is he the best winger in the game? Yep. Currently, yep. Who would um, who else could compete for that role? Oh, Lomax. Lomax. Uh, this year. Yeah. This year. This year, though. Yeah. Like I'm just talking about this year. Yeah. Ronaldo. 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 Um, those would be my top three. Mm. Um, different different players. Coats, maybe. Different players, different body shapes. Uh, different players do different things. Yeah. Um, you know, you know. I guess you can choose whether you like. What Brian does, Lomax or Ronaldo, it's it's up to you who you would think is number one. I would most probably go Ren Lomax of what he's done for the last, you know. As number one. Just in this year and what he's done with his performance. So what you're saying is your top three of wingers is the two New South wingers <laughs> and a Kiwis winger. Yeah, well, that's why they play for New South Wales. <laughs> That's why they play for New South Wales. They still, uh, still couldn't get the win. happy to get the props there. <laughs> we'll put a Kiwi in there for sure. Yo. But yeah, like each each to their own. I think you know you can argue that Brian is is number one too. I could put him right yeah out for his work rate right for mine. Brian is such a threat, strong. Yeah. He finishes tries. That's and he's not sure been like that for the last five yeah, years. You know what I mean? Like I think he's based probably since in, he yeah, came in. When you think about the, the time that he's come in, he's mostly yeah the best winger in his time that he's been on the on the field because he's been, you know, hits those 200s consistently each and every week and tackle breaks, you know, to have 95 already 
Well, where's he going to go by the end of the year? Could it be well, huge? And to do what he did backing up from Origin as well. Yeah, yep. definitely. Massive. Yeah, definitely. And especially by the end of the season, I mean, it, the Panthers will be there. So yeah. He pro- the Dragons may or may not be, you know. So, yeah. Shot for the question, Dills. I appreciated that one. I love when Adam has to give props to New South. But <laughs> last game of the week, which was yesterday, while we had to delay the show to Tuesday because of the Monday game, which I did enjoy because yeah. uh, it was Kings a great game, there. Bulldogs versus yeah. Eels at a core 22-18 to the Bulldogs, who probably deserved it, right? I mean, they were pretty electric. Oh. And the Eels, you know, got their, got their tries but weren't quite good enough in that game, I don't think. Yeah, most probably. I think we, I, you know, would have said a few other games were the game of the round, but this one most probably was mm. the most exciting game. Um, and I think everyone's on on the back of the Bulldogs and watching what they can do and how they can be de- deliver their performances consistently week in week out. And you can see the growth, how much growth that they've had in the eighteen months with Cameron Serraldo and where they're going in the direction. They've lost a couple of players through the game. You know, Joshua Curran, who's been enormous for them through the middle of the pack with his work rate and his consistent effort with what he does. Um, they got a sin bin in there as well, managed to keep them scoreless in that time as well, the Premier Eels, with the amount of tack they have and the players that they have in there that they can score points. So um, massive props to um, the Bulldogs and what they're doing. Um, be nice and patient. Yes, um, you know, the last 18 months has been tough, but getting the rewards now. And I think when we spoke about a lot of these... Um, coaches at the start of the show at the top of the show about um being nice and patient with your squad and having the right people in there and having trust in what you're trying to do um getting the right people in there i think obviously criden's been massive for the dogs this year his leadership's gone to another level um what he can do with the ball um is is enormous you know with him without the ball the best center in the game yep. easy uh, with what he can do i uh, showed his his um, ability in origin, he consistently has been shown it at Penrith when he was there, and now he's doing it again for the Bulldogs. He's a hard defender to get around. Um, his attack is, is next level. Uh, what he did early with Dejan Arce, oh, I felt sorry for Dejan because he was in a position, an unfamiliar position, up against a world-class centre. Yeah. Um, and then when they ran shape at him, he just couldn't he couldn't handle him. Um, he, was, he was so good with his skill. He's strong, he's got good feed, he's got an offload. And then when they put Connor Tracy and ran some different shape at him, they tried, They ran early ball at the start, then they put some block shape on, on Dejan Arce. They had every trick yeah. under the book and put different shapes on Dejan all the time so that he can get it here to have a different read every time. And most of the time, you know, they got around him and scored points. So I think that was the difference. That Their left side, Paris left side and the Bulldogs right side was enormous for them. So that, I think when you look at the game back and you have a look at that that right side of when Crichton was playing down there and Tracy when he was sweeping around, enormous. Yeah, he was outstanding from the start. He was almost toying with them in some of those occasions when he had the ball in his hand. Stephen Crichton had it waving it around mm. and making breaks for fun. And his skill level at times when he set up the try for Wilson just – Drew the wing and flicked it out. Then he backed up and he scored a double for himself. Young Wilson was outstanding. You know, they're missing Addo Carr, so they moved Carraz to the other side and put Wilson in. He was electrifying and through the middle. A couple of moments for me, Burton put up a towering oh, ball. Good luck. <laughs> um, towards the end of the game, or oh, first half, but poor Gutherson. <laughs> He, he no was idea. nowhere near. <laughs> he, he fell over and the ball was still <laughs> ages away. Poor fella. And unfortunately for the dogs, a couple He's of players were offside and they brought it back. But that bomb was a, was so was ugly. Ugly for a fullback. He had no chance of getting that. And that's the quality that someone like Burton has. And I'm talking again what Blair is saying about some of the recruitment that Cameron Serraldo has done over the last couple of years bringing those guys in from Penrith and their winning mentality and their know-how how to prep to contest and to compete at the highest level, even when games aren't going your way, even when the results aren't going your way, to be able to stay to that and be disciplined to stick to that, you come out the other side of it because they know the rewards. They know the rewards of working hard and what it can bring. It might not be instantaneous. It wasn't the case at the start of the year. 
but it's starting to come through. They're starting to see how Stephen Crichton applies himself every single day. And it's no coincidence that he plays like that consistently because of the way that he prepares. But we're talking about how good he was with the ball, origin night, mm. defensively, next level. The great players, they look like they have so much time on their hands, whether that's with the ball or without. And that was him defensively in origin. He just assessed situations. Players look like they're going to get outside of him, but he's got them covered. Mm. He just hunts people when he defends with the ball. He's, uh, he's a gazelle and a big, big, strong athlete. So, yeah, things are kicking into gear for the dogs. They're, I think they can be dangerous if they get to the playoffs. I think they can shake up a team or two. Is um is Crichton one of the best signings in recent years for a club? Like, you look at the turnaround, you look at his leadership, you look at how he's made such an impact – you look how crap the Bulldogs were the year before, you know? Well, you, you know, every year they say, oh, you know, who's been the best signing for any club? It's definitely him. And yep. there's there's no there's no two ways about it. He's, even when you when they get to the end of the year, it's still going to be him. Yep. Um, yep. So I think, yeah, he's the best signing this year for the club. Yeah, for the impact that he's had through his performances, but I... I Without being in the inner sanctum and seeing it, I reckon he's had a massive impact on every player every single day. Well, there was a great shot of the three players. Um, I think there was an injury or there was some sort of break, but you could see Crichton just mm. talking to the boys um, about a play that they wanted to do down the side there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I seen that the, the, the play was um, they had Tracy running across and dropping him yeah. back under. Uh, they tried it a couple of times, um, just I guess give him a, and like I said before, give uh, Dejan a different picture to see every time. And then they went back to just running a. So first they were running, giving him early ball and beating him with his speed and power and whatever his skill, which was good. Secondly, they ran some of that. They had that conversation around yeah. uh, how can we, what else can we do? Yeah. So they ran like a double drop play where they went him first, Crichton first, and then the winger come under, and then they went Crichton on his own, and then the next one they just run a normal simple block play, and it actually makes the centre, which we said at the start of the show, is that it's a hard position to defend, and that's why only the best can do it really well, Crichton, obviously. Um, so yeah, he saw what he saw early, then they changed it up on him, and then they changed it again. Every time they changed it up on him, the double drop didn't work. Okay, so what are we going to do next? I'll run a block shape. Connor Tracy beats him for speed because he was worried about Crichton playing that short runner. So... They did a really good job, and I guess for me that's leadership. That's knowing who's in front of you, knowing the the caliber of players around you, but then also for them to trust in Crichton and what he's trying to tell them and give them some examples of it. Then that's where I guess that's where he's been the biggest difference. I think his leadership, especially for Willis Wilson and Tracy, like allowing them to play what they want, but having him in and around and evolved around those things. And I I'll throw Preston in there too. Preston, yeah. yeah. Preston's been fantastic this year. Uh, they're talking about him being the future captain of the club, but mm. I've no doubt that some of uh, Critter's influence on him has been why he's playing so well too. Uh, so the Bulldogs are, remain as the only undefeated home team this year. Every other team has lost at home this year. Uh, and in his post-game interview on NRL 360, Crichton... Uh, which I liked, said how he, his wish was, or his thought was that they are top four yeah, team. Yeah, heard that, yep. So, ah, man. Yeah, I really love it how <laughs> his leadership, even to the, the interview, is shown with just how confident he sounded while saying that and just, like, the belief he showed in his team. Well, um, yeah, well, you, you got to be, you have to have confidence in the start of your season. When he would have turned up, like you said, Billy, the winning mentality, he knows what that looks like, he knows what it takes. So he's not coming in going, hey, boys, we're just going to be happy to be in the no. eight. It's like, no, no, we're competing for the big, the big game. We're playing for the big one. So we have to set our standards high so that we can play at that level and know what that is. I'll lead it because I'm the captain. Yep. I'll show you how to get there. I will help you guys be the best you can in and around me. I'll help the guys, Wilson, Tracy, Preston, be better every single game. And we aim for top four. Everyone wants to be top four. You've got to be because 
that's you get a second chance. You're competing at the end of the day. Um, so I just think, yeah, like you said, I love his confidence, but the confidence is because he knows what it looks like and knows what it takes to get there. And he's most probably running, pushing those standards every day consistently. And you can see the rewards, along with obviously Cameron Serrato, who's come from the similar system that knows what it wins. Having someone like him to back that and reinforce that up, the captain, then it just helps everyone understand what that is. So... You know, I think the confidence comes from being in it and working in it and living in it and, and breathing that winning culture. That's where that confidence comes from. Uh, on the Eels, uh, a, a highlighted player I'd like to do is, again, Blaze Talangi, who got pushed late to win because Mike Sivo uh, was ruled out with a hamstring niggle. And he made 17 tackles on the wing. What? And got an intercept as well. What the hell is this kid doing, man? He, how is he doing this? He's a magician. 17 tackles as a winger just sounds like a made-up number. Yeah, I don't know. Where, 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 I didn't see. <laughs> I didn't see. I didn't see him tackling that. Well, I wouldn't even. You know, wingers, man, they make what anywhere between one and five. Yeah, yeah. I think one the other wingers in this game, Max was six, which I think Wilson well, made. Yeah, that's, well, they, well, that's, they, a crazy that's stat. the normal stat. I'm guessing he found themselves in the centres. Um, I'm guessing he found himself mostly defending in the half at some stage, or or just I guess it shows that he's not afraid to get stuck in there and, and look for work. He's not just going to sit out there both in defence and attack. So um, you know he's very versatile with what he's been able to do in his short career. Uh, winger, centre, fullback, halves. Um, you know, put some pressure on the on the Parramatta Eels yeah. to try, make sure they lock him in and make sure that he can stay there because he can fit in to anywhere that they need. Um, and a quality player that still got a lot of growth, um, but he's involved in the game. 17 tackles is huge. And last thing, obviously, the injuries. The Bulldogs had the two head knocks and Preston suspected broken ankle. Painful because considering how yeah. nothing it really was, it wasn't really like a big... Yeah, hit or anything, or hip drop or anything. It was just a roll of the ankle. Yeah, as he come into contact there yeah. with the ball, he either he stood on his foot, the opposition's foot, or just got in a bad position and went over it. It wasn't a good look. He looked like he was in pain, and like Willie said, he's been, he was their best player. I think he got their best player last year for the club. I think he's, you know, he's been quality this year, and now that he's back on the field, and then he goes down with that injury. It, you know, it's a it's a tough game, rugby league, and for a quality player of him, and you know what he's been doing so far has been good. So, yeah, it's disappointing. Uh, it's disappointing for him. Yeah, it's always tough to see players go down with injuries. And sometimes the ones that seem like nothing's happened, you see a player run and he slips over, with, could be a bad hammy or could be an ACL. They're the dangerous ones almost. You know, when it's innocuous, but yeah, hopefully it's not too bad for him. And, but if it is, then hopefully uh, he can bounce back bigger and better. And Jermaine Hopgood was the last guy came out this morning from the coach that he uh, from Barrett he might maybe shouldn't have played him at all because he has a nerve issue in his back, which I assume uh, maybe it could have something to do with that tackle that Martin put on him or something. So that's why he played reduced minutes. Man, that would be a f massive loss for the Eels if Jermaine Hopgood has some kind of long-term issue in the back. And, well, not really for... It would be sad for Queensland, but more so the Eels. He oh, is we might see Fafita get on the bench then and get into... <laughs> <laughs> or just add another player to the bench. Or Piakura, maybe. Or Piakura or yeah. something like that. But, yeah, I guess no injury is a good injury, like a good injury for any person to have. And... Again, if he may surely went into it, I guess when you when you play a game before a game like Origin, you're playing at their highest level, whatever minutes you get, you're going to give it your all. You've got to be able to come back and back that up, and it's really hard. I guess there's a lot of stress on the body. Uh, recovery is most important, trying to get in there. You're not doing too much training till you get to the game day. Um, so there's most probably, if you haven't done it before, there's a little bit of... Um, mm getting your body used to backing up after games as well. So maybe a little bit of backing up is most probably cause a little bit of um, the pain in his back. And yeah, like you said, maybe that tackle as well. Sweet. That's all I've got for you today, Adam. Well, thank you so much, Ephraim. That is great. Anyway, Fano, <laughs> that's another episode of our beautiful game, Rugby League. I know there was a lot of Rugby League in there, but that was a huge episode. Make sure you guys tune in. <laughs> To this episode, make sure you follow, subscribe, like, whatever. Tell your whānau, tell your friends, and make sure you tune into this one. It's a goodie. Let's go.